Welcome to Human Monsters. Jane Doe was going through a transitional period. She had recently separated from the father of her baby. She agreed to move to the community of Cozy Cove, Ontario, with her boyfriend so that he could be close to his friends and family. She used to work at a bakery and had since become a homemaker and full-time mother. Her boyfriend frequently went on the road, working as part of a crew for a utilities company. As much as she loved spending time with her baby, she was also lonely and bored. It didn't help that she was an outsider in this new community. It was dubbed Geritol Lane by locals because seniors were highly represented among the population. There were also many military personnel, and most of the community was university educated. She just didn't fit in. She spent many of her days in isolation. A man stands for five minutes over a bed. He admires the figure of the woman sleeping soundly. She is young, blonde, petite, and attractive. She was alone, and that was ideal. To have a man on the premises would spell disaster. The gears were turning in his mind as a scenario played out in his imagination. He could picture it in vivid detail, as if reality were about to become a Xerox of his fantasies. His heart was pounding. His compulsions were driving him forward, as if he were just a flesh puppet with no autonomy to speak of. He wanted to rob her of autonomy. This was about his gratification. She was a tool, an instrument. He decided it was time for her to wake up. He punched her on the left side of the head. It was hard enough that she woke with a start. Before she could get a sense of what was happening, someone was on top of her. Some man was pressing her head against the bed while pinning himself on her with all his weight. He grabbed her hands and constrained them with one hand while covering her face with his right palm to keep her from looking at him. In another room, the woman's eight-week-old daughter was sound asleep in her crib. She didn't want to aggravate the intruder for fear that he would wake her daughter. She had no idea what this monster was capable of. She demanded information. She said, How did you get in? I locked the door. He was silent. She said, What time is it? The baby is sure to wake up crying at 4 a.m. He said, it's only 1 a.m. Don't worry. She had torn a chain from his neck. He put it into his pants pocket. She said, Are you going to kill me afterward? He said, No. Promise and everything. I'll do whatever you want. Just please don't hurt me or the baby. With what limited wiggle room remained, she attempted to lower her pajama bottoms. He slapped her hands. He was calling the shots. She said, we can just talk if you like. You really don't seem like a bad person. Not like the type of person who would do something like this. Do you work? He said, with a tone that was both firm and dismissive, no. She said, do you get bored like me? I get pretty bored looking after the baby around here all day. You must live around here, right? Her questions would go unanswered. He said, roll over onto your tummy. She did as she was told, and he aligned his crotch with her buttocks. He pinned all his weight on her back. He punched her with all his might on her head three times as a warning to stay quiet. He said, and don't ever try to look at my face. She thought, He's purposefully deepening his voice. She wondered if he was somebody she knew. He said, where's dad? She said, how do you know there's a dad? I could be a single mother. He said, how long have you lived here? 
Just a month. I hardly know anyone around here. He said, What's your name? Allison. She would become known as Jane Doe. Unexpectedly, he brushed his fingers tenderly against her temples. He traced them into the rest of her hair. They slid down to her shoulders. She flinched. Obviously, this was not the reaction he hoped for, as indicated by his response. I need to control you better. He grabbed some baby blankets and pillowcases that had been spread out nearby. He ordered Jane to put her arms behind her back. Jane knew that if he were to tie her up, her chance of escaping whatever fate had in store for her was slim to none. She said, I won't let you tie me up. This did nothing to change the situation. He was still in control. He used a baby blanket to tie James' arms behind her back. He took a pillowcase and cut it into strips, which were wrapped around her wrists. He placed an entire pillowcase across her eyes. He removed an elastic from her ponytail and secured the blindfold with it. The man brought Jane into the living room. She heard him remove something from a bag. She said, her voice trembling now, What is that? What's happening? As he led her back toward her bedroom, he said, You'll see, but don't worry. I'm not going to rape you, and I won't hurt you either. He pulled another pillowcase over her head, though he removed it when she began to hyperventilate. He tied it around the blindfold. Announcing the next phase of his agenda, he said, I've got a camera here. Jane said, You've taken my picture? Despite her limited vision, she got a murky sense of a camera flash. She said, I'm not really, um, very attractive since having my baby. The pregnancy packed on a lot of fat. The tactic of shedding light on what she considered to be her physical shortcomings did not dissuade him. He said, I think you're perfect and sweet. He exposed her left breast for one photo and the right for the next. He rolled her camisole down to her waist to take more photos. He kneaded her breasts and took more photos. Satisfied with this, he ordered her to stand and pull down her pajama bottoms. Jane said, You promised you weren't going to rape me. He said, I'm not. Just do as I say. He pulled her pajama bottoms off. He lifted her back onto the bed and forced her legs apart. She felt the camera strap brush against her inner thigh. He took some more photographs. Having finished with this, he left the room without warning. Jane was terrified that he was going to the baby's room. She thought, am I doing anything wrong? Should I be doing anything differently? The man returned to her room. He riffled through her dresser drawers. He stopped when he opened her underwear drawer. There was silence for a moment. After a few minutes, Jane was ordered to stand. As she did, the intruder gathered up the bedding. She said to him, Just please don't leave me without any clothes on. He told her to stand against the wall. He dressed her. He helped her put the pajama bottoms back on. He stood and stretched her camisole up from where it bunched up around her waist. He lifted it over her chest and placed the straps gingerly over her shoulders. Jane said, May I go check on my baby? His response was to grasp her arm firmly. He led her into the baby's room. Her arms were still tied behind her back. When Jane leaned over the crib to listen for her daughter's breathing, the intruder brushed his face against Jane's. A man handled her breasts. He asked her how old the baby was. He appeared to take a genuine interest. He issued the final instructions to Jane. 
She was to count to three hundred before she could remove her blindfold. She did as she was instructed. She stopped counting at seventy. The intruder said, Keep going! She kept counting. When Jane reached two hundred, she stopped counting. She bellowed out to him, but there was no response. He was gone. She ran to check on the baby and then grabbed the phone. After telling her boyfriend's mother what happened, she dialed 911. Ten minutes later, a car pulled into Jane's driveway. Her boyfriend's brother, mother, and a male friend got out. The men surveyed the adjacent fields and yards while Jane's boyfriend's mother comforted her. The men didn't find anybody, but they did find that the rear patio door was unlocked. Officers of the Ontario Provincial Police searched the surrounding area, but didn't find anything of interest. The bedding with which both the intruder and Jane had made contact was taken to the station as evidence. Swabs were taken from Jane's body so that the intruder's DNA could be detected. Though she was blindfolded during most of the attack, she was able to get a sense of what he looked like. She told police he appeared to be between 30 and 50 and, in her words, seemed like a dad. She didn't remember many other details except that he had a ring on one finger and he smelled, quote, dirty. Lori Messacott moved to Cozy Cove in 1999, accompanied by her husband and three daughters from a prior marriage. She enjoyed the backdrop of the township, surrounded as it was by wilderness. It was quiet and safe. Two qualities Lori and her family valued. Lori was sorely in need of peace of mind. Her second marriage ended in divorce and under acrimonious circumstances. Her parenting skills were called into question at the time by people who were connected or loosely associated with the parties involved, and this was another source of stress. She used to work as an accountant and now had to get used to a quiet life as a homemaker and stay-at-home mother. She didn't have any friends in Cozy Cove, further contributing to the feeling of alienation when she was left at home alone. Lori woke up one night after being stricken on the head. She was pinned to her couch by a Barbie comforter that had belonged to her daughter. Seven more blows were visited upon her head. She panicked. She tried desperately to break free from the restraints. Her breathing was constricted. She cried out, What's happening? An authoritative male voice said, Don't you realize what's going on? There was a tinge of sarcasm in his voice. He tightened his grip around her throat. He said, You're being cleared out. He said that other people were collecting her most valuable belongings. He claimed it was his charge to ensure her submission. He said, Shh, I need you to be quiet. Don't make a sound. She felt the pressure on her neck intensify. He leaned on her pressing his weight against her. His forearm weighed down on her throat. It caused Lori to gag. She said, Please don't. I can't breathe. She was crying now. She said, I have children. They can't find me like this. Please don't do this to me. Please. Lori convinced herself that the best approach to the situation was to calm herself. The intruder released some of the pressure on her jugular vein. He encouraged her to breathe deeply. Lori was breathing normally now. The intruder told her not to sit up or remove the comforter from her head. She was lying face down on the couch. 
Something was putting pressure on the back of her head. The intruder said, It's my job to control you. Don't dare challenge my authority. This is going to take a while, so just relax. The intruder said the robbery was planned to take place the previous evening, but somebody showed up and threw a monkey wrench into the proceedings. He told her he wanted to know who visited her at that time. Lori said, Nobody. I was here alone. This was true. Lori listed the locations in her home that housed her most valuable belongings, like jewelry. This did satisfy the attacker. He said, They'll take whatever they're going to take. Where's your family? Is anyone going to show up here? Lori said, Oh, God, no. Nobody can stand me. I don't have a family. Even my boyfriend can't stand me. He said, Will you promise to give us half an hour to get away? Lori said, Yes, of course I will. You're not as bad as those other guys. At least you're not stealing like them. She didn't hear sounds of people riffling through drawers and prowling from one room to the next. It was just her and the man in the room with her. Lori was desperate to smoke a cigarette. She felt it would help with her agitation. She asked the intruder to let her sit up. He said, I don't think I can let you do that. They wouldn't like that. She said, Do you smoke? He said, No. She decided to back off with the conversation for fear of antagonizing him. A few minutes later, the intruder said, I'll let you sit up, but trust me, you don't want to see me. Lori took his warning seriously. She sat up and kept the comforter around her sweaty face. She said, Maybe you could blindfold me instead? She recalled what she read about the Paul Bernardo case. Kristen French and Leslie Mahaffey let their blindfolds slip and thus became able to identify Bernardo, leading to their murders. She said, Here, you can use some of this material. She did her utmost to tear a strip from a Winnie the Pooh body pillow. He said, I'll take care of that. He grabbed the pillow from her. She heard the sounds of material being torn. He had been cutting it with a knife. Lori felt the intruder behind her. He reached up underneath the comforter to tie a blindfold around her head. He tied it so tightly, some of her hair was pressed into her eyes. She pleaded with him to loosen it somewhat. He said, Okay, well, let me see if I can fix it for you. Unexpectedly gentle, he loosened the blindfold's hold. He said, Is this better? She said, yes, thank you. The intruder used another strip of cloth to tie her wrists together behind her back. He said, can't have your hands loose. That would give you too much control. And the others wouldn't like that very much. Lori didn't resist. She knew that fighting back would only make things worse. He suddenly got up from the couch. He said, I have to go check on the others. A few minutes later, the intruder said to Lori, Are you looking at me? She said, God, no. She continued to remain submissive. Moments later, the man returned to where Lori was bound. She still didn't hear any other people milling about the house. She became even more anxious when she wondered about the implications of him lying about having accomplices for a non-existent robbery. His real agenda was likely far more malevolent. She broke out in a cold sweat. She said to the intruder, I have a really, really bad pounding headache. Do you think you could get me some Tylenol? To her surprise, he agreed and asked her where they were kept. She told him they were stored in the medicine cabinet of the bathrooms. He said, 
Well, how are you going to take them? You'll need some water. She said, There's a coffee cup right there on the end table. It's got an apple core in it, but you can just throw it in the waste bin in the first bathroom and use that cup. He said, All right, but I'm going to have to take you along to get this water. He led her down the hallway to the bathroom. After she took the cup, he asked her if she needed to use the toilet. She told him she already had. She nodded down at her pajama bottoms to show him that she evacuated her bladder while he was choking her. He took her back to the couch and stopped to rub her temples once she sat down. He said, sorry about that. He left to check on the others. The intruder returned with some Tylenol and a mug full of water. He held them against her lips and said, These are them, trust me. The water tasted odd, but she didn't complain. He said, Here, take another drink. She said, This water tastes funny. He didn't respond. Seeing that he was being more sympathetic towards her, she said, Please, can I just have my arms free? These ties are really hurting me, and my wrists are throbbing. He said his accomplices would object, but he said, I can't untie you, but maybe I can do something to loosen them up. But I'd need some more material. She said, My bedroom's right behind you. You'll find whatever you need in there. Sheets, pillowcases, whatever. Lori heard the hinges of her bedroom door squeak as he went looking for other materials. When he returned, he turned her torso so that her wrists, still bound, faced him. He said, Now stay still so I don't cut either of us. He sawed through her bindings with his knife. He also added some cable ties and wire to keep her restrained. Her arms broke from the restraints, and he grabbed her firmly. He used a pillowcase and large cable ties to construct a makeshift harness. He didn't tie it as tightly as he had with the other restraints. He said, I'm trying to make this as comfortable as possible for you. Is this okay? Lori nodded and whispered to the affirmative. All of a sudden, the intruder jumped to his feet. He was quiet and hypervigilant. He said, I thought you said that nobody was here. What's that I hear? Lori said, I've got two cats. It must be one of them. She heard him exhale with relief. He sat down on the couch and urged her to drink some more from the mug. She took two more small sips before telling him she'd had enough. They heard her cats again. He told her he was allergic to cats. One of the cats got up on her lap. Not wanting to antagonize the intruder, she nudged the cat off. It got back on. She said to the cat, Sorry, honey, you're going to have to get off my lap because this gentleman is allergic to cats. He said, That's okay. To her surprise, he showed even more humanity by getting to know her and making small talk. She asked him questions, too, like, So do you have a wife or children? He said, No. So why not? I'm too young. He removed himself from the conversation by checking on his phantom accomplices. Moments later, the intruder returned. He was breathing rapidly. Lori said, What's wrong? He said, Nothing. After he shuffled nervously throughout the living room, she heard her bamboo blinds rattle. The intruder returned. He sat beside Lori. She heard a zipper. She said, What are you doing? Do you have a gun? Oh my God, you're going to kill me, aren't you? He said, No, Lori, I'm not going to kill you. He sounded sincere, but it wasn't enough to allay her fears. He said, I've got a camera. I just want to take a couple of pictures of you. Take pictures? Why? Why would you want to take pictures of me? So that you know we have pictures of you. 
Is that honestly all you have? A camera? Is there a gun? I know you're going to kill me, aren't you? He rubbed the camera's strap against her cheek. He said, See, it's just a camera. Calm down, okay? He took a few photos. Having finished with that, he sat down on the couch beside her again. His breathing became heavy and fast to the point of panting. She asked him what was wrong, but got no response. After a moment, he said, I want to take some more pictures, but we'll need to pull this shirt up first. He caressed the material of her t-shirt. She felt the shirt being lifted from her midsection until it was gathered up around the base of her neck. He took more pictures of her. She squirmed. He sat down beside her again. She felt his coarse hand brush against her skin. It made its way across her chest and burrowed underneath her bra. He cupped one of her breasts. She said, oh my God, please don't. He removed his hand upon request, though he did say, you've got very nice breasts. Lori voiced disagreement. He said, yes, you do. You're beautiful. He slid his hand underneath her bra again. She told him to stop, and he did. He said, you can pull your shirt back down now. He helped her lower her shirt down to her waist. Lori was relieved. She hoped he wouldn't make another pass at her. Just then, he cut her t-shirt in two with his knife. He cut it with one slice without piercing her skin. She thought, whoa, he could have filleted me. She was shaking now. The intruder took two more pictures. He sat down on the couch and twisted Lori's torso around so that her back was facing him. He unhooked her bra and cut her shirt, exposing her back. She felt his hands move down to her stomach. He played with her navel rings. He enjoyed this, saying, Oh, that's nice. As he began to explore some other intimate areas of her body, she said, I've gone through some stuff lately, and I'm not sure if I'm pregnant or what. He said, How could that be? You're 47. She felt insulted by this. Hoping to put him off with more details, she said, I'm not sure what's going on. Maybe it's menopause, but something funky is happening anyway. He put his hand into her pajama bottoms. She said, Oh, please don't do that. Please don't. He removed his hand immediately. A few minutes later, he tried feeling her up again. She said, Please don't. This isn't good. I told you I had an accident. She heard him remove his knife from the sheath. She felt the cold metal of his blade against her stomach. She removed her pajama bottoms. He stood again. He took more pictures of her. She tried to conceal her sexual parts from his camera's view, but he wasn't having it. He said, move your hands. She politely declined to do so. He said, come on, just move your hands, okay? She removed her hands. He took another round of photos. She begged him not to post the photos on the internet. He grabbed her thigh and said, Come on, put your leg up on the couch. She said, Why are you doing this? He said, Because it has to be done. He took more pictures of her exposed flesh. She felt demeaned and violated. He grew tired of her resistance. He said, I'm running out of time. By this, he meant that the camera's batteries needed to be charged. She thought she heard the sounds of a gun being loaded. She said, what's that? What's going on? It's just the batteries. I had to recharge them a bit. She was relieved for the time being until I have one more thing for you to do. Stand up. I can't stand up. You're going to kill me if I do. 
Lori, I'm not going to kill you. Why are you doing this? She stood. He said, so that I can get on with my life and you can get on with yours. Her mind was racing. Among her thoughts were, stay strong and you'll survive. After all, God only gives people what they're capable of handling. If only I could astral project myself, lift my spirit from my body and assess my surroundings without his knowledge. The intruder told her to turn slowly in a circular motion. As she did, he took more photos. She trembled as he did so. After he was satisfied with this, he told her she could sit. She took her previous position on the couch. He covered her with the Barbie comforter. He told her he was going to check on the others. After a few moments of silence, he returned. There's just one more thing I need from you, Lori. She was frustrated with him now. She said, You promised when you made me stand up that those would be the last pictures you were going to take. He wouldn't let up. He said, I want you to get up on the couch on your hands and knees and put your head down on the armrest right there. Lori panicked. She said, why? I can't do that. There's no way. I can't. You've been cooperative so far, Lori. You can do it. I know you can. He became more authoritative now. He was not open to negotiation. Don't make me make you. Lori said, I'm going to need some help getting into that position. I can't do it by myself. The intruder helped her get into the position. She said, God, now I know you have a gun and you're going to kill me. Lori, I told you there would be no need for that. I don't have a gun. He took more pictures. He returned her to a sitting position on the couch. He took two more photos as she sat. She was unaware at the time that his penis appeared in the foreground of both photos. Eventually, he walked away and into the kitchen. She heard him making some clanking noises. She said, What are you doing? I'm wiping my prints off this coffee cup that I touched earlier. Well, you had better wipe off that Tylenol bottle, too. Oh, yes, good thinking, Lori. Having finished with those tasks, he stole a pair of her underwear from her bedroom's dresser. A few minutes later, he approached Lori and said, It's 4.30 a.m. now. They're done here, so I'm going to leave. I just want to make sure you uphold your end of the bargain, and they get out okay. So, I'll be back in ten minutes to check on you. She said, before you go, would it be possible for me to have a cigarette, please? He told her to wait for ten minutes, but he soon put a cigarette in her mouth and lit it. She soon realized it would be a bad idea to smoke while blindfolded. She told him to nix the idea. He said, patience, Lori. It's almost over. Moments later, Lori heard a loud banging noise in her garage. She listened and soon realized from the silence that he was gone. She turned on her television and saw that it was now 4.45 a.m. She called 911. She was so weak and anxious, she could barely connect her finger with the buttons. From her dialogue with the 911 dispatcher, Lori I'm not really sure what happened here. Apparently there were others. They were supposed to be robbing the place. And I just... This guy took pictures of me and, you know, I... Operator, do you know who it was? Lori, he blindfolded me. No, I didn't see a thing. I don't know if it was my ex-husband or who the heck this was. I have this weird feeling it was my ex and some other men. Operator, are you sure? Lori... No, I'm not sure. It's just that I've had some problems with him in the past. Operator. 
Is there any possibility that it's drug related? Lori, I have no idea. The dispatcher informed her that officers Halverson and Hart of the Ontario Provincial Police were on their way. She said, it won't be long before they're there. Lori said, they've been here before because of issues with my ex-husband, so they should be familiar with it. I'm sitting here and I'm really, really embarrassed right now. I don't want to have to go to the other end of the house to open the door for them. Can you please tell them to go around to the side door? I can unlock that one much faster when they get here. The dispatcher told Lori to remain where she was and the officers would arrive momentarily. The police brought in the canine unit, but they were unable to detect any notable scents. A forensic specialist discovered that a screen had been cut out of a window. At the OPP's Central Hastings Detachment in the township of Medoc, Lori was interviewed about the attack. At one point, Detective Constable Russ Alexander said, The same thing happened to another lady on your street 12 days ago, and we didn't get the message out to the public. I'm afraid we didn't warn you guys, but I can assure you that we're getting the word out now. A press release is being prepared, and it'll be in tomorrow's news. The OPP took to -to door-to-door canvassing to speak with the residents of the community of Cozy Cove. There were no promising leads. One resident, Colonel Russell Williams, who was the commander of Eight Wing Trenton, an Air Force base, was not seen as a valid suspect. Why would a high-ranking member of the armed forces even consider doing such a thing? As one younger OPP officer thought to himself, Commander, eh? Well, I guess there's no need to bother him. Detective Constable Russ Alexander promised Laurie Massacott that he would issue a press release germane to the invasion, transcribed verbatim from the press release. The Ontario Provincial Police, OPP, Central Hastings Detachment, are investigating two break-ins that occurred in which a male suspect entered the home while the residents were sleeping. On September 17th and again on September 30th, 2009, Both in the early hours of the morning, an unknown male entered Tweed residences. During both separate incidents, the suspect struck the female victim, tied her to a chair, and took photos of her. The suspect then fled the scene. The OPP want to remind everyone to ensure all doors and windows are secured and to practice personal safety. Please report any suspicious activity to the police immediately by calling 911. OPP officers are following up leads to identify the suspect. If anyone has information about these incidents, they are asked to call the Central Hastings OPP or Sergeant Christine Ray. The claim that either of the victims was tied to a chair turned out to be erroneous. Even more erroneous, were the rumors that began to spread. The intruder took a detour on the way home from work. He had been recently promoted, and the loneliness of the new position led his thoughts astray, and they tread some very lascivious ground. The impulses were pushing him beyond the outer reaches of common sense and regard for the safety and well-being of others. Out in these hinterlands, he stood alone, with no one to admonish him for the impulses that most people would have found disconcerting. He switched off his Blackberry so that its GPS function wouldn't keep a log of his movements. He took his watch off for fear that the glare from its face would attract attention. Years of military service got him in the habit of being prepared, especially for blind spots. He had to think like a chess player to avoid getting caught. He brought a black and yellow duffel bag with him, which contained his rape kit, the items contained within. Pre-cut lengths of green marine rope, plastic zip ties, a roll of gray duct tape, 
a heavy red flashlight, a knife, photographic equipment, including a camera, camcorder, and tripod, a black skull cap, a dark blue headband. Marie France Como had just returned from a trip overseas. She gave her boyfriend a brief rundown of the experience over the phone. She told him she wanted to flesh it out in more detail in person. His name was Paul Belanger, and he, like Marie France, was employed by the military base nearby, Canadian Forces Trenton. They made plans to meet the following night. She was 38 years old and came from a family with intergenerational ties to the military. Her father, grandfather, and great-grandfather had served, and now it was her turn. She worked as a forklift operator at CFB Trenton. Working conditions were often trying, since she mostly worked outdoors. Sunstroke and frostbite were occupational hazards, but she was never daunted by risking those possibilities. Master Corporal Franz Bro commented on her stoicism. Tough conditions, but I've never heard Marie Franz complain. She did her job with her usual smile, really making a difference. Eventually, she was selected to work as a VIP flight attendant on planes that ferried prime ministers, royalty, and other notable people across Canada and abroad. Things were really looking up for Marie Franz. The intruder's newest target, Marie France Como. She was just his type, thin, attractive, and he knew for a fact that she lived alone. He learned that about her during a reconnaissance visit to her home a week before. He was aware that she was away on a business trip. After taking a walk around the house, he slipped through a basement window. After checking the bathroom and closet, he was assured that a man didn't live on the premises. He took a walk around the house. He was most keen on having a look around her bedroom. He riffled through her drawers until he found her sex toys and undergarments. He tried on a few pairs of her panties. He kept a few as trophies. He didn't bother to shut the drawer, nor did he put the items contained within back in order. The intruder grabbed the duffel bag and got back in his SUV. Moments later, the intruder crouched down in the backyard of Marie France's house. Suddenly, she appeared in her bedroom, talking on the phone. He waited impatiently for her to go to sleep. It was cold out, and he was anxious for her to get some shut-eye. After a few minutes in the cold, it was more than he was willing to tolerate, and he went back to the house. He slipped in through the same basement window. Enjoying the warmth of the basement, he got situated by the furnace. He unzipped the duffel bag and examined all the items. He decided it was time to put a mask on his face. He put the skull cap on. He put the headband on beneath his eyes. Most of his facial features were obscured. Now it was just a matter of making the right move at the right time. Moments later, a cat got an eyeful of the intruder, and it meowed. The intruder tried to deflect its attention, but the cat was too territorial to be dismissed so easily. Marie France appeared at the top of the stairs leading to the basement. She said, Bixby, where are you? She turned the basement lights on. She walked down the wooden stairs. She continued to call the cat. Marie France was naked, save for a shawl she had draped around her shoulders. She said, there you are, mister. She walked over to Bixby, who was standing in the corner. Bixby didn't acknowledge Marie France. His attentions were drawn inextricably elsewhere. She turned in that direction. She was stunned to see a man standing there. The man was wearing a mask and stood behind the furnace. He advanced toward her. 
He was much taller. She shouted, You bastard! He clouded her with a flashlight on her head to silence her. He was hoping he could knock her unconscious. He broke the skin on her scalp, and the wound began to bleed. She retaliated, but he was too big and tall for her. He smashed her skull with the flashlight a few more times, until she fell backwards. He lunged on her, smearing her blood across the floor in the process. He pulled her arms behind her back and bound them tightly with the green rope. Having secured the knot, he stood, grabbed her just above her elbow, and yanked her to her feet. He led her by the rope to a dark gray metallic jack support post. She felt a steel pin tear into her back. He gathered some laundry that had been left around and tied her to the post. He tied a section of rope around her thighs to secure her legs in place. He placed a strip of duct tape on her mouth to keep her quiet. He took up the shawl she had been wearing before the scuffle. He draped it over her left shoulder. A few minutes later, he was taking photos of her as she struggled in vain against her restraints. He walked upstairs, leading bloody footprints on every step. The intruder went outside and put the basement window screen back into place. He went back in the house and had a look around the kitchen. A house key had been left on the counter. He put it in the front door lock and snapped it off so that anybody with a key would not be able to disrupt what he had in store for Marie Franz that evening. He returned to the kitchen and grabbed a handful of steak knives. He went into her bedroom and placed her comforter over the closed blinds in her window. He stabbed it with the steak knives straight through the drywall to keep it in place. Next, he went from room to room, unplugging nightlights. He tracked Marie France's blood all over the house. The intruder returned to the basement. He warned Marie France to stay quiet and refrain from struggling as he cut the duct tape from her mouth and the ties from her torso. He left her wrists tied behind her back. He led her to the stairs and pushed her upwards. She began to scream. She tried to break from his grip. He put a stop to that. He grabbed her head and smashed it into the wall. Blood sprayed from her head. He left a head-shaped hole in the drywall. He had knocked her out, and as she fell to the stairs, her hair smeared blood on the wall. He decided this was her fault since he cautioned her against making any effort toward escaping. Minutes later, the intruder returned. He took photos of Marie France unconscious, naked, and bleeding. He snapped a close-up shot of her vagina. He captured some close-ups of the cuts and bruises he inflicted on her face and chest. The intruder carried Marie France to her bedroom and laid her on the bed. He went to the bathroom and brought in a towel to tie around her head. He left a very small opening for her mouth so she could breathe. He wrapped duct tape around the towel until it was secured. He tied the excess green rope around her wrists into a figure eight knot behind her buttocks. He set up his camcorder on the tripod and set it up at the foot of the bed. He focused the viewfinder on the star, Marie France. He pressed record. He disrobed. The intruder climbed onto the bed wearing nothing but the makeshift mask. He turned Marie France over onto her back. He spread her legs. He knelt between her legs with his back facing the camcorder. He grabbed her knees and yanked her toward him. Her head rolled off the pillow, but he put it back in place. He inserted himself into her. 
Marie France began to wake. She whispered, no. He ignored her protestations. As he continued to rape her, he used his free hand to take still photos. He would continue to take photos intermittently. He suddenly stopped. He walked back to the tripod, where the camera captured her struggling and moaning within the restraints. She made no headway. The intruder climbed back onto the bed. His hips were aligned with her buttocks. He grabbed her left ankle and covered her tattoo with his hand. He held her left leg as he defiled her from the side. He eventually advanced to the missionary position. Minutes later, the intruder had withdrawn. He sat behind her on the bed. He caressed her buttocks. He bent to stare more closely at her buttocks. He was still hard. He slid his right hand down her buttock as he spread her cheeks. He got up to adjust the camcorder. Just then, his breathing became labored, heavier and faster than before. He got back onto the bed and flipped Marie France on her stomach. He said, get up on your knees. He pulled her hips toward him aggressively. He penetrated her again. He grabbed his still camera and took several photos of her vagina. He put the camera aside and sat up straighter. He pulled her hips nearer to him. Marie France couldn't keep it to herself anymore. She had to say something. She said, get out, get out. I want you to leave. I want you to leave. He ignored her pleas for mercy, but he was aroused by her distress and took more photos to capture her anguished expression for posterity. She told him to get out again. He continued to rape her, arranging and rearranging her into different positions as he took photos. He showed off for the camera as he demonstrated his sexual prowess. At the 17 minute mark of the video, the intruder removed the skull cap and headband and tossed them to the side. He covered Marie France's face with his hand. He smiled at the camera as he rubbed her chest and stomach. He bent over to kiss her cheek as he continued to penetrate her. He whispered to her as he placed his left hand over her eyes. He pressed his face against her as he grunted. He continued penetrating her. He reached down between their legs and wiped in an upward trajectory from their genitalia to her chest. He admired himself as he raped her from the side. He would take occasional breaks to take photos. At one point, Marie France nearly fell off the bed. He said, don't fall over, don't fall over. Something about his voice suggested he was motivated by genuine concern. Nevertheless, the defilement continued. He leaned forward to bite one of her breasts. She said, please, can I ask you something? Can you please undo my hands? I would like, it's tight. I won't go anywhere, you know that, please. He ignored her. He was too focused on his midsection where all the action was. He was real proud of himself, showing off for his future audience of one whenever he would choose to watch the video. He snapped a few more photos of her. He was careful to savor her anguish and distress. As he adjusted the camera, Marie France repositioned herself into a sitting stance. The intruder zoomed in. He got back on the bed and pushed her to the middle of the mattress. He kissed her vagina. He stuck his penis back in for another round of rape. He planted his hand down on the duct tape wrapped around her eyes. He suddenly stopped and said, stay there. He got up from the bed and returned with a tube of KY jelly. He smiled at the camera as he squeezed a large amount on his fingers. 
Marie France tried to sit up, but the intruder pushed her back down. He put the jelly on her vagina. He tossed the tube over to the foot of the bed. He got on top of her and raped her for a few more minutes. He looked back at the camcorder afterwards. He pulled out and ejaculated into his palm. He got up and walked to the bathroom, switching the camcorder off as he left the room. A moment later, Marie France heard the toilet being flushed. She saw the intruder walk into the living room to check the window for any activity in the neighborhood. She knew this was her only chance to escape. There was a small window in the bathroom. She wondered if she could make it there before the intruder came back in the room. She was dizzy and unsure of her footing, so it wouldn't be easy. She pushed herself up to her feet. She ran to the bedroom door and slammed it shut. She ran from there to the bathroom. She heard the bedroom door's knob being rattled behind her. Once in the bathroom, Marie France tried to lock the door, but she was so nervous she couldn't put the mechanism in place in time, and the intruder broke through the door. He threw her against the wall. Her head broke the glass face of a framed picture. He grabbed her by the hair and pulled her back to the bedroom where he deposited her on the edge of the mattress. She closed her eyes and sat quietly with her head hanging, assuming it would be what he wanted. As he restarted his camcorder, he said, Now stay here. He lined up the shot with her in it. He said, Put your head up. She lost her balance and fell to the floor, hitting it knee first. He told her to stand up. When she didn't, he grabbed her arm and yanked her back onto the bed. She was hyperventilating as his eyes drifted back and forth between her and his penis, which was still hard. He raped her once again and took more photos of her as she lay desolate, sprawled out on the bed. He went over to her dresser and riffled through her underwear and lingerie. When he found the items that appealed to him the most, he laid them down on Marie France as she lay still on the mattress. He covered her legs and lower body with them. He took photos of this display. He brought out more lingerie and even took photos of the drawers themselves, as if to document his success in violating her inner sanctum in toto. He removed the camcorder from the tripod and carried it around the bed, taking close-up shots of her. The intruder returned the camcorder to the tripod. His breathing was labored once again, fast and intense. He removed the lingerie from Marie France's body, two items at a time. He put some of them into his duffel bag. He returned to the bed and raped her by grinding his knuckles into her anus. As he recorded it, Marie France tried once again to wriggle free from her restraints. She started rocking back and forth. She moaned loudly. She said, oh, oh, oh. He put the camera back on the tripod and climbed onto the bed beside her. He said, shh, shh. He knelt beside her. He rubbed her buttocks and whispered into her ear. He pressed his face against hers. She said, no, no, please. She attempted to escape from the pressure of his weight, but it was no use. She said, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. He said, shh, shh. She said, no, no, please. He checked the camera to ensure it was still recording. Marie France said, no, no, I don't want to. Leave me alone. He sat upright and placed his left hand over her nose and mouth. She went limp and still as an effort to fake unconsciousness. He withdrew for a moment to take stock of the situation. After a moment of this, he grabbed a pillow and forced it down on her face. He pressed all his weight down on it. She started kicking and screaming. She shouted, No! In her desperation to survive, she twisted herself out from underneath his hand. She kicked and swung her legs around. She screamed, No! I don't want to die! 
He jumped off the bed. He grabbed the pillow and pressed it back onto her face. She still fought back, screaming that she didn't want to die. They wrestled for several minutes. She finally managed to push him off. He stood and continued to smother her with the pillow. At one point, he said, Shut up! Shh! She fought to free her hands. He said, Stop moving and be quiet. I'll let you breathe. Stop! Shut up! And I will let you breathe. Just shut up! She stopped resisting and said, Okay. He relieved the pressure from her face. He said, There you go. Uh Uh-huh. There you go. She said, I don't want to die. The intruder said, Shh. Shh. He stood, pillow in hand, lightly against her face. He leaned into her as he contemplated what action to take next. He looked from the floor to the camcorder. He tore the duct tape loose from her. She began to fight him again. She rolled back and forth across the bed. He said, no, no. She struggled so much she rolled off the bed. He said, be quiet and I'll let you breathe. Be quiet or I'll suffocate you. Do you understand? Do you understand? Okay, you have to be quiet. He repeated this repeatedly before he told her to stand up. She said, I won't do nothing. He pulled her up. He pushed her while he walked toward the camera. He held the pillow in his hand. She said, okay, okay, I'll walk, I'll walk. He held onto the rope behind her back as if it were a leash. He threw the pillow on the bed. He said, water? She said, yes. He said, hold on then. He yanked the leash back to him. He said, come here, come here, I'll get you water. Sit down. He pulled her back to the bed and told her to sit. He said, stay there. He put the skull cap and headband back over his face. Marie France said, you're going to kill me, aren't you? The intruder began to dress himself. He said, no. She said, When are you going to do that? When are you going to leave? He said, soon. After he finished getting dressed, he took up the roll of duct tape. He walked over to her and said, get up. Get up. She stood but turned her back to him. She said, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Who said you were going to die? You are going to kill me, I know. Go away, go away. He reached out as if to comfort her. She rejected the gesture. She said, please go, no, go please, go. Go, just go away, just go. Shh, I'm going to go. You're going to kill me. No, I'm not. Go, go, please go, I don't deserve this. Please go, I don't deserve to die. Please, go. Please. I've been good all my life. Please, I won't tell anybody you ever came. He still clung to the rope that bound her wrists together. He reactivated the camcorder and pressed record. Marie France said, Please give me a chance. Please. I want to live so badly. Did you expect to? Yes. Give me a chance and I'll be so good. Please. I want to live so badly. The intruder approached her slowly. He affixed a piece of duct tape on her nose. He took a step backwards. She said, please, I don't deserve this. I have been good all my life. I will be much better after that. Please go, please go away. She slid down to the floor with her knees pointing upwards. She continued to plead for her life. Have a heart, please. I've been really good. I want to live. She rested her head against the wall. Her back was against a mirror. The intruder watched her and observed himself in the mirror. Marie France stopped breathing. Marie France Como's death 
was later ruled to have been the result of asphyxiation. The intruder took two more photos of his victim. He took one as she was positioned at the moment of her death. He repositioned her so that she was lying on her stomach on the floor. Recording was ceased. The recording resumed in the laundry room of the house. The intruder riffled through a pile of soiled laundry. He paused the camcorder. The recording picked up moments later as Marie France was spread out lying on her back on top of the bed. The intruder removed the towel and duct tape from her face. Another pause. The tape picked up after the intruder took the burgundy comforter he nailed to the window and placed it over Marie France Como's dead and lifeless body. Before he left, he threw all the sheets from her bed into the washer and emptied out a bottle of bleach in its entirety. He left through the back door of the house and called it a night. November 25th, 2009. Marie France Como's body was discovered by her boyfriend, Paul Belanger, the next day. She hadn't responded to his calls and texts, and it wasn't like her to do so. He was in tears and struggled to compose himself. The Ontario Provincial Police launched an investigation. The Ontario Provincial Police launched an investigation. There was substantial media coverage congruent with the rumor mill that was grinding at full tilt as the community's denizens speculated on the circumstances of the murder. Marie France was highly regarded as reflected in the words of a military colleague. She was a fun person who loved life and seemed to find the best about everything she did. Kim Hill Chornaby was quoted as saying, Her smile will forever live on in the hearts of those who knew her and were lucky enough to call her a friend. Retired Master Corporal Franz Bro found it difficult to comprehend that someone would have wanted to visit such brutality on Marie Franz. She would never say anything to hurt anyone. She was so thoughtful. If someone had a bad day at the camp, somehow Marie would know about it, and she would find herself comforting that soldier. Her brother, Mark andre Como, who serves in the military, said, I don't know if the next months will be as difficult as the last. I know, however, that you are smiling now, and this eases my anger. In the meantime, OPP detectives still clung to the belief that Marie France's rape and murder was an isolated incident. Next victim. Jessica Lloyd wasn't yet aware of it, but before she arrived home, her house was being canvassed by an intruder with his designs on having his way with her body. He was both a hunter and a trapper, and he was very taken by the attractive brunette he saw running on her treadmill in her house. This was vintage prowling. If he had been dressed like the Hamburglar, the uniform would have completed the stereotype. Once traffic thinned out on the highway nearby, he took up his duffel bag and headed for the back of the house. Unfortunately for Jessica, the patio door was unlocked. He explored the interior of the house with a flashlight in hand. Confident that no man lived in the house, he left out the back door and hid within a tree line where he awaited Jessica's arrival. 10.30 p.m. Jessica showed up. She turned on some lights and walked past the back window. Just minutes later, she got herself ready for bed. With the lights having been turned off, the intruder advanced from the tree line. He pulled his black headband down to conceal his face. He entered through the patio door. Having cased the house previously, he knew exactly where to find his victim. When he entered her bedroom, she was already asleep. 
After a couple of minutes of watching Jessica, he punched her in the head to knock her out. He took up his flashlight. Suddenly, Jessica opened her eyes. The intruder before her said, Don't scream. Jessica was paralyzed by fear. She complied with his directives. He said, Lie down in your tummy. She did as she was told. He tied some green rope around her wrists after pulling her arms behind her back. He said, Keep your eyes shut. You don't want to see me. He yanked her up to her feet. He brought her out to the hallway, where he took three photographs of her from disparate angles. She kept her eyes shut tightly as he did so. He wrapped duct tape around her eyes. He made sure to take a photo of this before leading her back to the bed. To prevent her escape, he made her lie on her back on the bed, where he tied her wrists to the headboard using a length of rope. Once he was sure emancipation was beyond her reach, he walked away. A few minutes later, the intruder returned to Jessica's room with lamps to provide the light he would need to produce quality photos and video footage. He put two lamps on each of her bedside tables. He set up the tripod at the foot of the bed. He positioned his camcorder and adjusted the lens to get the shot he saw as ideal. After he pressed record, he took photos of her lingerie while riffling through her underwear drawers. Having explored her lingerie collection to his satisfaction, he put his still camera on the bed. He untied the rope that bound Jessica to the headboard. He pulled up her top, leaving her stomach exposed. He left the room. When the intruder returned, he held a Leatherman military-grade multi-purpose instrument. He used the knife blade to tear down the middle of her shirt, revealing her breasts. Anxious to avoid more harm than he intended to inflict on her, she arched her back to make it easier. He threw the fabric of her shirt to the floor, along with the sheets and comforter. He grabbed his camera and pointed it in her face. He said, Open your mouth. He adjusted the duct tape on her eyes to ensure it would remain. He told her to close her mouth. He yanked her sweatpants down to her knees. He took some more photos before removing her pants. He removed her panties and put them on her right thigh. He took up the camcorder and shot footage up and down Jessica's body. He gave her directions. Spread your legs. Bend your knees. Open your mouth. Close it. You want to survive this, don't you? She nodded and said, Yes. He said, Okay, good. You're doing good. He began to remove his own clothes along with the coverings on his face. He took more photos of her naked body, including close-ups. He stopped for a moment and said, Why do you shave your pussy? She said, I don't know, I just do. I have for a while now. Spread your legs further. He captured more footage of her body. His hands made contact between her legs. She flinched. She found herself apologizing, saying, Oh, geez, I'm sorry. Such was the degree of confusion the situation inflicted on her. She continued to comply as he shot more video and took more stills. He would violate her with his fingers from time to time, and she allowed this too, in hopes that if it was what he wanted, he would take it and leave her intact. He said, get your ass up in the air. He repositioned the lamps as if he were a professional pornographer. He subjected her to bouts of oral and vaginal sex while intermittently pausing to pose for the camcorder or take some still shots. After doing this for a time, he
he removed some large black plastic zip ties from the duffel bag. He told her to kneel. He got on the bed and tied two zip ties around her neck. He tightened them as much as he could, stopping short of asphyxiation. He said to her, What do you think is happening now? Jessica was terrified and distraught. She said, I don't know. The intruder grabbed the camcorder from the tripod and approached her, capturing her torment for all it was worth. He said, Okay, now this is the test. She said, Okay. He pulled on the zip ties. He said, You feel that? She nodded. He said, I feel something I don't like. I pull on that, and you die. Got it? Do you want to die? Jessica shook her head and said, No. The intruder said, Okay, open your mouth. He stepped back to get a shot of her face so he could capture her look of terror. He stood on the bed and inserted his penis into her mouth while holding the zip tie in his hand, threateningly. He withdrew so he could take some stills and then put it back as the camera was poised just inches away from her face. After a few more minutes of oral sex, he ejaculated and forced her to swallow his semen. He said, lie down on your back. She rolled over onto her stomach. He took more photos of her genitalia. After taking a few more photos of her in that position, he told her to stand against the wall. She trembled as he fondled her breasts and stomach. The intruder went to one of her lingerie drawers and brought her two light pink items. He started to dress her in the lingerie as he said, Lift up your right leg. Now your left. He straightened the panties on her hips and smoothed out the creases to his satisfaction. He took a step back to admire how she looked. He kissed her breasts. He lifted a sheer pink teddy over her head and pulled it over her side. He made her strike several poses as he took stills. He said, go on the bed, on your knees. Put your face down. He pulled her panties down slowly. He left them dangling from her left ankle. The intruder forced Jessica to perform more oral sex and to be penetrated by him. He relished her facial expressions as he raped her. He was turned on by how distraught she was. He passed his fingers through her hair, which was now loose after having been tied into a bun. Moments later, the intruder got up and walked to the doorway. She held her legs in the air as he instructed, for fear of the possible consequences of not doing so. She struggled to breathe normally. She was so frightened. He said to her, Do you have a cat? No, that was my stomach. Sorry. As if retarded, he repeated himself. Do you have a cat? He could not be convinced that a feline did not inhabit the premises. She said, Is it okay if I put my legs down? I'm shaking. He granted this request as he got dressed. She heard zipping noises and the sound of the knife as it was being locked into position. The video faded to black. The intruder returned the lamps to the rooms where he had gotten them. He returned to Jessica's bedroom and helped her get dressed. He chose the clothes and shoes. He was still convinced that a cat or something else was on the prowl in Jessica's house. He decided to take her to his place. He promised that if she cooperated, he would release her unscathed. She agreed for fear of what he would have done in the event of her resistance. Twenty-five minutes later, the car the intruder put Jessica in came to a stop. She heard a garage door open. The vehicle drove inside. It was about 4.30 a.m. 
Once the intruder brought Jessica inside, he ordered her to take a shower. He helped her undress and got in the shower with her. He set up the camcorder to capture the incident. He also took several stills. She showered with the green rope, duct tape, and zip tie still binding her. At one point he said of the temperature, All right? She said, It's a bit hot on my arms. He adjusted the water. He said, All right? She nodded. He lathered her up with soap and washed her. Having finished with that, he shut the water off. Jessica said, Is there any possible way I could get some clothes? I'm freezing cold. He grabbed a towel and dried her. He left her shivering in the shower. He walked away, shutting off the camcorder and preparing it for the next recording in his bedroom. Minutes later, the intruder brought Jessica to his bed. He told her to lie down with him and get some rest. He tied the remainder of the green rope around his wrist so she couldn't escape. A few hours later, Jessica woke, and the intruder was recording her. At one point, she mumbled something incoherent. He asked her to repeat. She said, I don't feel good. What can I do? I have to go somewhere. How far did you say you lived from the hospital? She was surprised by what seemed to be genuine concern on his part. It was a ploy. He lied, saying, 15 minutes. In reality, the nearest hospital was a 40-minute drive away. She said, How are you going to get me there? He walked over to the bed. He put his arm around her. He whispered, Move over, move over. She said, I don't want to move. I don't want to get up. He pulled the bedding down to her hips. He passed his hand over her buttocks and shoulders. He said, Hey, come on, take some deep breaths. Take some deep breaths. He pulled the pillow away from her head. She said, Get someone who can help me. If you can't take me to the hospital, take me home. He caressed her hair, brushing it along her head. He ran it all the way down to her shoulders. He said, Here, put your head to the side. Don't make it worse for yourself, Jessica. Talk to me, Jessica. Talk to me. She began to slur her words. You have to take me to the hospital. You have to take me or I'm gonna die. He continued to feel her head. He said, hey, 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 Jessica, dry your eyes. Dry your eyes. Come on, come on, roll over. Jessica retched. She felt like she was going to vomit any moment. She rolled over onto her back and went into convulsions. The intruder said, Come, come on, don't bite your tongue. He caressed her face tenderly. Relax, relax, stay with me, Jessica. She continued to convulse. She insisted she would die if he didn't get her to a hospital. She stuttered and slurred as she conveyed this to him. He held her head in his hand. He said, what can I do to help you in the meantime? She asked him to prevent her from biting her tongue. He pushed her lips together with his finger and said, Keep your mouth closed, okay? She nodded and said, We have to go, because I only have 20 minutes from the time it starts. He said, Okay, okay, try to swallow. Jessica curled up into the fetal position and began to gag and convulse. The intruder ran to the camcorder to record her reactions. She continued to warn him about her impending seizure and the importance of seeking medical attention. He dressed her as she continued to struggle with convulsions. At one point, she said to her captor, If I die, will you make sure my mom knows that I love her? The tape faded to black. fade in. Jessica was curled up on a floor behind a couch. A pillow was provided for her head, and she lay beneath an afghan. The intruder, of course, had ignored her appeals for medical attention. 
He simply took an hour break as a rest period for himself. He wasn't done raping her, and he wanted her to do some more modeling. He activated the camcorder for another bout of torture. The next shot started with Jessica sitting on a toilet, urinating, as her captor filmed her. Next shot. Jessica stood against a wall in his bedroom. She was fully clothed, aside from being barefoot. The captor pulled up her sweater. He pulled off the rest of her clothes with her assistance so he could get it over with. After confirming that she still could not see him, he took several still shots of her. The camcorder was positioned on the tripod and ready to record. The captor brought some of her lingerie with them. He told her to put on the pink items and pose as directed. Having finished with this, he took more stills. He ordered her to remove the lingerie. He caressed her buttocks. He made a remark about a tattoo on her lower back. He said, passing his fingers over it, That's a nice tattoo. When did you get that? She said, About four years ago, I think. He stood behind her. She was facing a mirror. He wrapped his arms around her waist, holding her tightly. He reached up and fondled her breasts. She felt his nearly erect penis against her tattoo. He pawed her all over and kissed her on her head and cheek. Hours later, the captor forced Jessica to model eight sets of lingerie for him. He played with himself as she put them on. Sometimes he would assist her when her lack of vision made it awkward for her to adorn herself with the lingerie. He would always smooth out any creases and wrinkles, fussing over every garment. Sometimes between photos, he would touch her. On four occasions, he would stop the modeling sessions to force her to perform oral sex on him. He would fondle the zip tie to send the message of what would happen if she gave a dissatisfactory performance or, say, bitten him. He kissed her more and more frequently on the mouth and forced cunnilingus on her. Later, after getting Jessica some water and checking his Blackberry for texts, he said, Okay, come on. He led her to the mirror. She stood in front of it, crossing her hands in front of her midsection. Her captor said, You all right? Yeah, I'm just a little cold. She was shivering, in fact. He extended a pair of panties, bearing logos of the hockey team, the Toronto Maple Leafs, toward her. He said, Put them on. Are you a Leafs fan? Jessica laughed. Yeah. I take it these are my Leafs underwear, then. I just don't admit to being a fan. Me too. I wonder if the Leafs have any idea what their underwear is on. He pressed his hand against her buttocks to smooth out some wrinkles in the lingerie. He added, They would be so proud of you. He took more stills of her in different poses. Once he was satisfied with this latest addition to his portfolio, he said, Take them down. He took up the lingerie on the floor and threw them to the other side of the room. He saw that Jessica was crying. He wiped her eyes and ran his thumb across her cheek to catch her tears. He leaned in and kissed her mouth. He put his arm around her and pulled her closer. He produced a pair of her underwear, a burgundy thong. He said, why don't you wear them? He held them as she stepped into the leg holes. He smoothed out the creases and wrinkles. He kissed her tenderly on the shoulder. He took more photos of her as he directed the poses. At one point, he had her on the floor, posing on her stomach. He kissed her buttocks and awaited her reaction. There was none. He brushed her long hair from her shoulder. He put a brassiere in her hand. As she put it on, 
he fondled his flaccid penis. He performed cunnilingus on her, first through the thong, and then pulled it down for direct contact. He licked it forcefully, what in some circles has been dubbed tornado tongue. Later, another video scene. Jessica was lying naked and stationary on a mattress in a different bedroom. Her captor spread her legs and knelt between her thighs. He leaned in and performed oral sex on her. His still camera was timed to record images at precisely timed intervals. He pulled her legs to bring her torso closer to him. He pulled up onto her. He kissed her on the mouth as he raped her in the missionary position. He lifted her legs up and spread them to both sides of him. She didn't want to be kissed by him on the mouth and drew attention away from it, encouraging contact with her cheek and neck. Prostitutes don't kiss their tricks on the mouth because it's too intimate, and this asshole was the last guy on earth with whom Jessica wanted to be intimate. She tried with all her might to suppress the moans that kicked up as his penis rubbed against her clitoris. It was like she was being betrayed by her own body. There was no way she was going to let herself enjoy this. He pressed his lips against her cheek. To delay ejaculation, he took a break to take more stills and perform oral sex on Jessica. A few minutes later, he began to rape her again. He pressed her head down on the mattress to keep it from moving. He kissed and licked her lips while taking occasional looks at the camcorder's lens. He rubbed his head against her breasts. He wiped the sweat of his eyebrows on her chest. As he continued to defile her, he forced his tongue into her mouth. He held off ejaculation by pausing for more cunnilingus. He continued to wipe his sweat off on her. He would also wipe the smegma from his penis on her face and chest after withdrawing from her vagina. He kissed her neck and bosom. He leaned in and placed his hands on each side of her head to pin it down. He continued to penetrate her. The video stopped after two hours and three minutes of recording. There was no more room on the tape. Before the recording ceased, Jessica was permitted to get dressed. Her captor gave her a plate of fruit to eat. He told her they would be leaving anon. The camcorder may have crapped out, but the still camera hadn't run out of juice and he took photos of her fully dressed and bound. He made her smile for some of the photos, which was demeaning in its own way. Finally, he told her it was time to depart. He said he would drop her off at home, and everything that had transpired in the preceding hours would pass into memory like a bad dream. Moments later, Jessica was brought into the garage. Still blindfolded, she didn't anticipate that she would be bludgeoned. She fell to the floor after a painful and debilitating blow was delivered to her head. Her head was wounded. Blood pooled around it. Her skull was fractured. Such was the force of the strike. She was still alive, nonetheless. He knelt and wrapped a section of the green rope around her neck. He choked her as her body twitched and kicked. She was still unconscious, with her body on autopilot, but still desperate to remain in the pink. He pulled harder on the rope. Minutes later, she grew still. The first thing to occur to him was to take some photos. Sure enough, he took three pictures of her lifeless body as it lay in her own blood. He cut off the zip tie to retain as a memento. He tied her body into the fetal position with duct tape. He cleaned the blood from the floor and left Jessica's body where it was for a while. He would dispose of it at a later time, as he saw it, 
priority number one was to get to work. Jessica's mother and brother went to her house to check on her after she failed to respond to their calls. Her brother noted that there were tire tracks in the snow out front that did not match the treads of Jessica's car's tires. Her brother also noted a trail of footprints in the backyard that were clearly not made by Jessica because the person who left them clearly had larger feet. The police took note of this and the tire and foot tracks became part of the body of evidence that was analyzed with rigor. Jessica's disappearance was reported to Belleville police who began to investigate. An extensive search for Jessica's body, live or dead, began and all available resources were utilized, including the Belleville Police Services Auxiliary Unit, the OPP Emergency Response Team, the Sterling Rodden Police Service, hundreds of volunteers from the surrounding community, an OPP helicopter, a yellow Cormorant search and rescue helicopter provided by Colonel Russell Williams, commander of the local military base, posters, flyers. On February 3rd, 2010, Belleville Police issued this communique to the women of the community. Police are advising that there is a safety concern for women living alone in our community and urging extra precautions such as changing personal routines, securing premises, and being in the company of others. Thomas Rogerson, who is a footwear and tire impression analyst for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, determined that the strange tire tracks were made by a Toyota Open Country SUV with HT tires. The police stopped vehicles that resembled the SUV. One such vehicle that was pulled over was a silver 2001 Nissan Pathfinder. The motorist was clad in a military uniform. It was Colonel Russell Williams, commander for Canadian Forces Base Trenton, which is Canada's largest and most active military base. He lived on the outskirts of the township of Tweed, where Jessica's house was located. He drove from home to work and vice versa in that district. He was asked about Jessica Lloyd. He said he had never been acquainted with her, though he acknowledged that he drove past her house on a regular basis. He said he hadn't noticed anything unusual while driving past her house on the night she disappeared. The police officer was so taken with the uniform and Williams' distinguished record as a member of the armed forces that he dismissed any possibility that he could be a suspect. With that, Williams was sent on his way. At least, that is how Russell Williams remembered it. Unbeknownst to him, the police were about to place him on 24-hour surveillance and apply for search warrants so they could take a look around in his cottage in Cozy Cove and his larger house in Ottawa, in which he resided with his wife, Mary Elizabeth Harriman. In fact, undercover police tailed him as he spent time with his wife in Ottawa. They also observed as he cleaned and vacuumed his Pathfinder at a self-service car wash outlet. After he drove away, police flashed their badges and seized the vacuum canister. Despite all these efforts, they still did not have enough evidence to draw a straight line from Russell Williams to the crimes that afflicted Marie France Como, Lori Massacott, Jane Doe, and Jessica Lloyd. February 7, 2010, 2 p.m. OPP Behavioral Sciences expert Detective Sergeant Jim Smith called Russell Williams at his house in Ottawa. He asked him to meet with him to discuss the disappearance of Jessica Lloyd. Williams put up no resistance, agreeing to meet with Smith at Ottawa Police Headquarters at 3 p.m. that very day. The following is the audio track of Russell Williams's interrogation which was captured on both audio and video. 
I'm just happy to see Jerry Russell. The guy I was speaking with him, whatever night that was was Russ as well. Oh yeah. And he took uh, took every number I had. Yeah. Now they were doing some pretty thorough interviews that night. So. Yeah, absolutely. It was All great. Right. Glad to see it. Uh, I'm just going to move your gloves in. That's a little microphone, just okay. to make sure they're nice and clear. Um, as you can see here, everything in this room is uh, videotaped and audio taped. Check. Uh, <laughs> you ever been interviewed by the police in a, in a room like this before? I or? have never been interviewed like this. Oh, no? Okay. No. Let's get this set up here. Well, I guess the closest uh, interview by NIS for top secret clearance. Oh, yeah? All right. Well, again, Russell, I appreciate you coming in uh, an investigation like this. I mean, I'm sure you can appreciate it's been big news, uh, yeah. especially down uh, Belleville Way. Um, and, you know, obviously our approach to cases like this is that uh, uh, we don't give up on somebody being alive until mm -hmm. we get evidence that they're not. So um, because of that, we're treating uh, Jessica's case uh, as an emergent situation, Absolutely. obviously. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're fast-forwarding things that we might normally take our time with, mm -hmm. um, and that's why... Uh, we're here on a Sunday afternoon, uh, sure. so uh, again, I appreciate it. Okay. Um, we're going to do a pretty thorough interview today, okay? okay. Um, and the reason for that is because uh, the last thing we want is to be calling people back again and again and again, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go over a number of things, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to explain what all those are to you, okay? okay? Um, I'm a big coffee guy. I don't know if you're a, a coffee guy or not, I'm but I didn't want to drink in front of you, so... No, I appreciate um, that. All right, go ahead. I could uh, definitely have the black. Yeah, they're just black with uh, with sugar. Um, I'm just going to take them out. I just started my gum, so I probably have it a little bit. Started your what, sorry? Gum. Just oh, okay. Just a piece of gum. <laughs> well, there's napkins there if you want to toss it around. I appreciate that. All right. And again, um, like I said, this interview is going to be very thorough. Mm -hmm. um, but again, uh, I have a simple rule when I talk to people. It's uh, I'm sure you're the same way. I, I treat people, everybody with respect. I don't yeah. know why I ask you to do the same for me. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start off by uh, going through um, what your rights are, okay? okay? Just like everybody else, okay? okay. Um, have you ever been read your rights before? No. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you've seen it on TV a whole bunch of times, right. but that's usually the American version. So okay. I'll go over with you briefly, okay? Mm -hmm. um, basically in Canada, uh, as you know, I'm sure, is uh, we all have uh, our rights guaranteed under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, right. okay? Now, uh, Russell, just to avoid any confusion, because people do get confused when they're talked to by the police, is mm -hmm. that uh, um, you're obviously not under arrest here today, okay? Yeah. Anytime you feel uh, you want to leave here, you feel free to do so. The door's not locked. Teresa will walk you down the lobby anytime you want, okay? okay. Um, if there's anything that comes up in our interview today, Russell, that, uh, that you feel you want to talk uh, to a lawyer about, okay. um, you, just, uh, you just let me know, okay? Sure. And the reason for that is I want to explain to you exactly what's going on here, okay? Um, uh, Jessica uh, Lloyd is, um, is one of uh, four cases that we're currently investigating, okay? Right. Um, and essentially what's happened is over the past uh, uh, about four or five months, yeah. um, there have been four occurrences, that, like I said, that we're looking into. Mm. Uh, two of those occurrences occurred in September of 2009. Yeah. Um, and very briefly, they were up in the, uh, the Tweed area. Yeah. Uh, they involved uh, somebody entering uh, two different women's houses mm. um, in the evening hours and uh, committing uh, sexual acts. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in uh, November of 2009, yeah. uh, a young lady by the name of uh, Marie-France uh, Como um, yeah. Yeah, was found uh, murdered in her home in Brighton. Yeah. And um, we believe that there was a sexual uh, component to that crime as well. Okay. And um, then, most recently, we have Jessica Lloyd's disappearance. Mm -hmm. Okay. So essentially, when you look at those kind of crimes, we're looking at a number of different uh, potential criminal charges. Right. Um, we're looking at issues uh, all the way from the most serious one, which is first-degree murder, mm -hmm. uh, kidnapping, uh, sexual assault, mm -hmm. uh, break and enter with intent to commit sexual assault, yeah. um, forcible confinement. Okay. And uh, so what I want to make sure you understand, and this is what we've been doing with everybody we've been talking to, is that clearly when we find out who's responsible for one or all of those crimes, yeah. uh, they could be charged with one or all of those offenses, okay? Whether it's you or whether it's anybody else, right? Absolutely. And that's why it's important that we uh, make sure that people understand what they have to do and what they don't have to do when they're talking to us, mm -hmm. okay? So as I said before, any point today uh, you feel the need, you want to speak to a lawyer, uh, you let me know, and okay. uh, we can take you to a room where you can do that in private, okay? okay. Um, do you have your own lawyer? I have a realty lawyer, but okay. no, I don't have a lawyer. <laughs> All right. 
Um, if at any point you want to make that call and you don't know who to call, mm -hmm. uh, we have a phone list of lawyers that uh, are available to give you advice free of charge right over the phone. Okay. okay? So again, if at any point today you want to uh, take advantage of that, you just let me know. Sure. Um, is there any reason you want to call a lawyer now? No. Nope. Okay. A um, couple other uh, fairly simple and straightforward uh, things that uh, you probably understand, but uh, again, we go over them to make sure everybody's clear, mm -hmm. is that uh, you don't have to speak to me today, okay? okay? And the reason for that is because the law considers me to be what we refer to as a person of authority, mm -hmm. okay? Probably similar to what you may be considered to be on the base. Yeah. Um, and because of that, I can be compelled to appear before any judge in the country, basically, to account for what takes place here today between you and I, sure. okay? And that's the reason why everything's recorded, yeah, um, because there can't be any more accurate record than that, right? So, no, understood. Um, and the other thing I want to make sure you understand is that uh, you know you mentioned a second ago about uh, Miss Como um, being one of your uh, work associates. Um, so I don't know what's happened since November um, on the military side of things, um, but what we want to make people clear on is that uh, if you have been spoken to by any person in authority or any police officer about any of those cases. Um, I don't want what they may have said to you to uh, um, make you feel influenced or compelled to say anything to me today, okay? Whatever you might have felt influenced or compelled to say to them earlier, mm -hmm. you don't have to repeat it to me and you don't have to say anything further, okay? okay? But obviously what you do say, you know, for the third time is being recorded, right? So, um, I understood. These first two attacks uh, happened uh, not that far from my place in Tweed. Well, the second one did. Yeah. We didn't even know the first one had happened, but uh, I understand that was reasonably close as well. But the second one was uh, was very close. Yeah. So certainly at the time, the OPP did a uh, went door to door. And yeah. And uh, within a couple of days, probably the same night, so I spoke with a couple of guys then. Okay. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm aware of that from uh, looking at the different cases. And essentially, uh, Russell, uh, in a nutshell, that's what we wanted to, uh, to talk to you about, okay? Um, those four cases are of uh, concern to us. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you've kind of uh, almost hit the nail on the head about uh, some of our issues that kind of uh, make us want to talk to, to Russell Williams, okay? Because mm -hmm. um, essentially, uh, there's a, a, a connection um, between you and, uh, and all four of those cases. Would you agree? Geographically, and then I guess I drive past. Uh, yes, I, I would yeah. have to say there's a, a connection. Yeah. Yeah, and that's wh that's why um, I'll be quite frank with you. That's why uh, things kind of um, uh, evolved when uh, the officers talked to you on Thursday night. Okay. Uh, we kind of went from there because uh, when I think you discussed with them the fact that you were a uh, uh, a colonel yeah. uh, at the base. I was in uniform at the time, so. Yeah, so pretty obvious, right? Yeah. Um, so essentially, uh, then the connection with Miss Como um, yeah. was made, um, and I believe you're uh, a door or two down from one of those two uh, incidents uh, I think, in Tweed. Uh, three doors down, yeah. Yeah. Very close, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So uh, those are some of the issues we wanted to discuss with you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so just getting back to uh, these four incidents that we're talking about. Um, maybe you could just give me a little bit of history as to uh, your arrival in, in the uh, in the base in Trenton. When did you start working there? Friday on the day I was um, hmm. Friday on the day I was at home most of the time. Most of the day I had a sort of a stomach flu. Okay. In Ottawa or Tweed? In Tweed. In Tweed? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we backtrack then. So all day Friday, you're at home. Yeah. And then w w what time do you leave to go to the base to sleep there on the Friday night? Um, mm, not sure. Probably just you know went in for just before bed. Uh, so I probably left tweeted between eight and nine or so. Okay. Um, and you get to the base and. Spend the evening there and get up for the 5:30. Yeah. Okay. That's right. So we backtrack from there. Um, you. When did you arrive at your home? Uh, at the cottage. Can, I wonder. I want to get confused between your home in Ottawa and the home. Yeah. In Tweed, so uh, no, I had been in Tweed all week. Yeah. Uh, the week prior now. Um, yeah, I think that's the case. I was in Tweed all week. Flew Saturday. Saturday night. Okay. So, um, if you didn't have the stomach flu on the Friday, what was your I schedule that day? Eight, really. Okay. Um, 
What would have been in my schedule? Just a standard schedule in the office. Okay. So, uh, office brief in the morning, a couple of uh, a couple of meetings. I can't remember what the specifics uh, were going to be. Okay. So um, Thursday night, you slept at Tweed, or you? Yep. All right. And what did you do Thursday during the day? Thursday during the day, I was at the base again. Um, I think it was a fairly standard day. I can't recall exactly, but uh, yeah, nothing. I was not flying, so I was at the base. So I would have gone in early in the morning, back in the evening again. Okay. Do you remember what time you left the base that night? I don't remember anything peculiar, so I would say, uh, I don't know, probably seven to nine, somewhere in that range. Okay. And that's when you, you left? Left the base, yeah. And what it was that's a 45 minute transit. So. 45 minutes home? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm not, not going to walk you through November, but I'm going to take you to a date that's probably pretty fresh in your mind, uh, uh, the day that, uh, that Marie Franz uh, coma. Yeah. Um, do you remember how you found out? I uh, do. Yeah, I was sent an email. Um, Well, as soon as the uh, the op staff and the base learned, they told me. Okay. So I got an email. I can't remember if it was late at night or early in the morning. It was certainly I saw it. Uh, I want to say first thing in the morning because I had just come back from Ottawa. I was in Ottawa for um, um, a set of meetings on one of the days. I can't remember what what day of the week we're talking about, but uh, yeah, no, I mean. Obviously, when your people get skilled, it uh, gets your attention. So. Absolutely. Yeah, I very much remember that coming in. And how did you know Marie Franz Coma? I'd only met her once. Um, she was on a crew uh, I was on uh, just after I got to the base. Okay. So uh, I can't even remember. I think it was a one day trip. Uh, I did a, a number of trips uh, in Canada transporting um, our um, you know, troops, sort of first leg out of Edmonton. Uh, you know, we tend to hopscotch them across uh, until they get into theater. So, uh, anyway, I, I can't remember which trip it was, but uh, we did a number of them out to Edmonton just to, to pick up the troops, bring them to Trenton, and then uh, put a fresh crew on, and because uh, we'd fly out and back in the same day, so pushing the edge of that, and uh, fresh crew on, and continue on after a couple hour delay. Okay. Do you know uh, roughly when that happened? That we were on the same crew. The time you met her, the one time there, yeah. It was soon after I got to the base, so uh, I, I don't remember exactly, but I would say in the first couple of months, so August, September. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, you got that email yeah. notifying you that something had happened. Yeah. Uh, do you have uh, any kind of a, a clear recollection as to how your schedule was going that week? Well, I can't remember what, again, what day that uh, the message came in, just a second. Um, No, I can't remember what day, day of the week, but I, um, I just think there was a whole bunch of activity uh, spun up as a result, obviously. No, I can't remember the day of the week. Um, I'm just trying to think through the news reports I read. No, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember what day that was, but... Uh, What I what we learned after the fact was that the um, the MPs had learnt uh, of her death. I think quite a bit after her body had been discovered. Okay. So I think what happened. No, I'm sorry, just a second. Okay. So I think. If I remember correctly, the MPs learned late that evening. I can't remember when, obviously, her, her body was discovered. It was probably in the news reports. But uh, so they learned, and then they passed it to ops. That so they immediately passed it to me. Okay. The MPs work for the wing operations officer, so they go you know through their chain of command, and then as soon as the uh, the duty watch officer had that information, she advised me. Okay. Um, so again, that that along with, with some others. 
Right, right. I'm sure it spread like wildfire. Yeah, yeah, so. Um, so that particular week, uh, do you have any recollection? Well, for instance, when you got the email, uh, yeah. do you remember where you were? I was at home in Tweed. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you remember that was a week that you were um, reasonably stable in Trenton, or had you flown? No, I had been in Ottawa. I had been in Ottawa early in the week uh, for some meetings over in, uh, in Gatineau for one of the, um, it's actually for the C-17 acquisition. I was project director and when I was here in Ottawa for that, so just some follow-up stuff for that. Okay. So I had been here um, at some point in that week, again, I can't remember how the days all fell together, but um, I seem to remember that I got this word shortly after having come back from Ottawa. It seems to me it was the same week. So if we were to, uh, to you know, do a, a similar uh, investigation in your background, is there, is there anything you can think of that anybody may have misinterpreted or anything uh, in your history that somebody might say Russell Williams uh, Absolutely. did this? No. Okay. It'll be very boring. What's that? It'll be very boring. <laughs> All right. Because essentially that's what I'm looking at. Is it... Uh, um, I th you seem like a very intelligent person, and I think you can see how um, a surprise like that would uh, certainly set off some alarm bells in an investigation, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, so the next thing we need to cover off is, uh, well, I'll just ask you this straight out. Uh, given the types of crimes we're investigating, uh, do you get much chance to, uh, to watch television shows, CSI, things like that? I do watch... Uh I prefer Law and Order, but I do watch CSI occasionally. Yes. Okay, so you have an idea of obviously the forensic capabilities, things like that, are out there. What would you be willing to give me today to help me um, move past you in this investigation? What uh, What do you need? Well, um, would you be willing to supply things like fingerprints, blood samples, sure. things like that? Yeah. Okay. Um, footwear impressions. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I think that's what we're going to we're going to ask you to do. Okay. All right. Now we have a process we have to go through to do that. Okay. Um, and for the blood sample, uh, I don't take the blood sample. We have specially trained officers that are trained to do that. Okay. Uh, I'm going to step out and make sure they're still available. Can I assume you're going to be discreet? It's possible. Yeah. Because uh, you know this would have a very significant impact on the base if they thought you thought I did this. Well, uh, bottom line, Russell, that's one of the reasons we're here on a Sunday afternoon. Okay. Um, uh, the uh, the military would certainly be of great assistance for, to us, especially mm -hmm. in relation to Ms. Como's investigation. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's certainly one of the things that went into our decision to, to give you a call at home today and see if we could deal with this today. Okay. So, okay. Um, Is this tough to undo the rumor mill once it gets started? Now that you've had some time to, I mean, I know we've been throwing a lot of things at you here, but now you've had some time to, to think about things. Um, is there anything uh, that you're concerned about uh, that buckle swab matching in any of those four residences? Um, no. Is there, I guess, let me explain you what I'm getting at here, Russell, okay? Um, this is a significant investigation, as you can, yep, so as you can well imagine. Yep. Um, that, uh, that DNA is going to be uh, significant in our investigation, both, uh, you know, quite possibly to help you, quite possibly to help yeah, us. Understood. I don't know yet. I don't know what the result is yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll go back to the example I gave you because it's a very similar uh, issue, I think. Um, and you talked about the idea of discretion here, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about the idea that, uh, um, you know, you, well, I think hopefully you appreciate the fact of how we approached you here. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, and essentially, uh, we have no issues with that. Okay, um, we we talked recently about you know the whole idea of any unusual sex acts in your history. Mm -hmm. um, but another thing that can often happen in cases like this is that people um, become concerned about uh, um, things like extramarital affairs, mm -hmm. uh, indiscretions along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, is there any contact that you may have had with any of those four women? Um, that you may not want your wife to be aware of, anything like that that we should know about to try and uh, explain why 
if if your DNA is found, it would help us understand why it may be there. Absolutely not. Okay. Can you think of any reason um, why we would find your DNA in any of those residences? Let's let's focus on well, for instance, uh, I believe. Let me just check the name there. Make sure I've got the right address. Talking about the house that was just uh, a couple of doors down from you there in uh, in Tweed. A couple um, of doors down was yeah. Lori. I don't know her last name. But I don't know. Mazzucati. I don't even know what her last name is, but uh, there's a, the, the woman down the road, three doors down. Was, yep. Her name is Lori. I don't know her last name. All right. Let me just make sure we're on the same page here. Uh, my understanding is she lived at 76 Cozy Cove. Yeah, so she would be the one, the second one, uh, the second incident on your on your road there. Yeah. A couple of doors down. Ever been in her house? No. We met her once, I think the first summer um, we were there, so in 04. Okay. And that's what I'm getting at. I, I, again, this is a credibility issue, right? Yeah. Because I don't want to come and see you two weeks from now and say, you know, Russ, uh, yeah. our CSI people in that house. And uh, are you familiar with how C uh, DNA works? I think broadly, yes. I okay. guess. Um, one of the challenges we have in 2010 with DNA is it's become so uh, precise that um, I guess the best way to explain it is I can think back 15 years ago when I started in. Uh, in violent crime investigation, yeah. um, for us to get a DNA match, the sample we had to find was, um, you know, probably would have filled half of one of these cups. Okay. You know, because they destroy so much of the uh, the sample in the in the testing. Okay. Um, essentially, DNA has become more and more precise to the point where, when you and I walked in this room earlier today, mm -hmm. uh, we could have sat down, talked for 30 seconds, yeah. walked out. CSI officer could have come in. Three four days from now, yeah. did some swabs here, and he would have found your DNA and my DNA, mm -hmm. and probably a lot of other people's DNA. Sure, um, a little bit gross to think about, but essentially, uh, you know, as we talk, um, we, you know, a little bit of aspirate comes out of our mouth yeah. no, that uh, that contains our DNA, our blood, or uh, our skin cells contain our DNA, yeah. and that's what I'm getting at. If you were ever in Lori's residence, uh -huh. quite possibly, quite innocently, your DNA could be uh, in that residence. Has there ever been a time you've been in there? No. Okay. Um, what about the other lady down the road? On uh, I hadn't even heard that name, so no, I don't. I don't actually know who that was. Okay. Have you ever vi visited uh, uh, Marie Franz Como at her residence? No. Okay. All right. Um, so you're quite positive there'd be no reason why your DNA would be in any of those three locations. Okay. Um, did you know Jessica Lloyd even in passing for any reason? No, I didn't hear hear her name until it was on the news. Okay. And the reason I'm asking you that uh, is because um, I know you were asked that question on Thursday night, and sometimes what we find, and again, this is one of those situations that can sometimes cause us to get in a lengthy investigation as somebody that mm -hmm. maybe doesn't deserve it. Mm -hmm. uh, but what what can happen sometimes is they, you know, somebody gets stopped by the police like you did, and they uh, they get asked that question, and people when they're stopped by the police they can be nervous. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so they blurt out an answer, and then they start driving away, and they go, oh, why did I do that? Because the problem is, is that once they uh, get asked again, then they feel compelled to maintain that answer for fear that if they change their answer, yeah. somebody could find it. You understand what I'm saying? I do. Okay. So I want to make sure that's not happening here. I don't care what you said to the officers on Thursday night no. last week. Um, if there's any uh, communication or contact between you and Jessica Lloyd, you've seen her picture, right, around town? Yeah, yeah okay. absolutely. Ever seen her before? I don't know. I would say I have not. Okay. All right. All right. And you mentioned something about uh, doing some renovations at your uh, at your property in Tweed there. Um, I think you said something earlier about tearing up carpet. Correct me if I'm wrong. But oh, yeah. Okay. When did all that happen? In 2004 or five. Okay. Any recent uh, renovations? No. Okay. All right. Want to make sure I'm covering all the bases here. Um, okay. What kind of tires do you have on your Pathfinder? I think um, I think they're Toyo. 
Okay. Do you know the brand name or sorry the uh, I think make? That is, uh, um, I don't. Remember. Sorry, the, the make is Toyo. Yeah. I don't know the model. Okay. I'll right, read this off to you. See if it rings a bell. Ever heard of uh, does Toyo Open Country HTS? That sounds make any right. sense? Yeah. Okay. When did you have those tires put on your Pathfinder? Well, it's the second version we've had of them, so uh, I think it might have been this past fall. They replaced other ones we had on the same. Okay. Well, Toyo, I can't say that they were the same, exactly the same model, but uh, our dealership here in Ottawa says they're very popular for the Pathfinder, so okay. they were good. They lasted a long time. All right. Um, I've had to, uh, I think you were talking about the the whole idea of the MPs uh, helping us with our investigation mm -hmm. stuff like this. Uh, you have the same system as we do at our headquarters with the swipe cards. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things uh, one of our investigators did is they made a call while I was talking to you there um, because we were trying to work through that week of the, uh, the 23rd of November. Okay. Um, 23rd being the Monday, uh, 24th being the Tuesday. Okay. Um, what, what, they've, what they've told us is that, um, and I want to make sure I get this right, is that uh, on the 23rd, uh, your swipe card was being used at the base, okay? Okay. Uh, on Tuesday 24th, there was no use of your swipe card. Okay. okay? And then on the, uh, the following days, uh, the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, um, there was what appeared to be average activity of your okay. swipe card in the base. Does that make sense to you? It does. That, that says that I was in Ottawa on the Tuesday. Okay. Do you remember where uh, in Ottawa you were? Yeah, I was in Gatineau with, uh, as I said, meeting about the uh, C-17. Okay. Um, now, again, I want to be fair to you here, we're going back two months. Yeah. Um, are you sure that would have been the, uh, the day you were in Ottawa? Well, only because I wasn't at the base. Okay. So I, I can't remember, honestly, that that's the day I had the meeting in Ottawa, but uh, if I wasn't at the base, it was because I was here. Okay. Now, if that is the day you had a meeting in Ottawa, um, do you remember being at the base on the Monday, uh, the 23rd, and swiping your card in and out? Do you remember what you would have done that evening to, to, to get to Ottawa for that meeting? Like, would it be... Uh, I drove to Ottawa in the morning of the day of my meeting, so if it was the Tuesday, then I would have left uh, Tweed. It was a very foggy morning okay. uh, that morning. I drove in that morning. Okay. So I would not have been at the base uh, the day I was in Ottawa, because the meeting started at 8.30 or something. Okay, so you leave the base, you would have went home to, to your residence in Tweed. Yep. And then you left Tweed in the morning and drove up to your meeting in Ottawa. Yep. Okay. Um, you leave the, the meeting in Ottawa, is a daytime meeting, evening meeting, or do you remember? Uh, yeah, yeah, it was a, a daytime meeting, finished, I don't know, mid-afternoon or so. Okay. We had lunch and then uh, finished. I think uh, my wife and I had dinner because she was here for work, and then I headed back. Okay. Um, well, that's these are the kind of things I'm trying to draw out here. That's helpful to us. Um, do you remember where you had dinner? <laughs> uh, well, I don't remember exactly the restaurant, but it was in Westboro because that's where our house was being built at the time. So we had dinner, you know, in a restaurant that we would expect to be able to frequent uh, once the house was finished. Okay. Remember how you paid? Uh, one of us would have paid by MasterCard. I think. Okay. Are, are you sure about that? Or pretty sure. That's normally how we uh, okay. we pay for meals. All right. Can't and remember if it was me or my wife that paid, but one of us. Okay. And do you remember which restaurant it was again? No. Okay. All right. And you see what I'm getting at, right? I mean, th that can be very helpful for us because yeah. if we can track yeah. uh, that issue, right? Uh, oh, yeah. We can we can put somebody paying for a, a meal at a, at a location. Oh, I was meeting with. Uh, 15 people or so that day so okay what time did the meeting end I would say between three and four okay and um, are you sure that that's the same day you went out with your wife well I think so yeah because she was here and uh, I, I think that was the day we went to this restaurant in Westbury yes okay um, you finished dinner and do you remember what you did that evening? I would have driven back to Tweed. Okay. And you would have... Now, 
again, I, I know we're talking two months ago here, but do you yeah. remember specifically having dinner and then driving back to Tweed, or uh, do you remember, uh, are you just guessing here? No, I'm not really guessing. I mean, I, I believe that this night at this restaurant was following the meetings in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, kissed my wife goodbye and headed back to Tweet okay. to go to work the next day. Okay. Um, all right. The, uh, the tires that you have on your truck, right, the reason I asked you about that is there, is there any time, I mean, uh, you recall uh, where you were stopped um, by the officers there? Yes. Okay. Did they explain to you what the significance so of that was? That was her house. That was her house. Yeah. Okay. So you remember that location? Yep. Do you remember what the crossroad was? Or I don't think there was a crossroad. It's sort of just uh, on the south end of 37. Okay. Um, when you get stopped at that location, has there been a time in the recent uh, one or two weeks that uh, your vehicle has uh, left that road for any reason whatsoever? Have you driven into a field with your vehicle at all? Um, for any reason you can think of. No. Okay. Because um, I want you to rack your brain here. This is important. So, yeah, yeah. is there anything you can remember doing that, uh, you know, would have caused you to, to uh, drive off the road no. at that section of roadway? No. That's my early, uh, that's the early part of the highway, and I'm um, just head north. It's about 30 minutes from there to, uh, uh, probably 20 from there to my house. Okay. Um, would it surprise you to know that uh, when the CSI officers were uh, looking around uh, her property uh, that they identified um, a set of tire tracks uh, to the north of her property, um, looks as if the vehicle left the road mm -hmm. and uh, drove along the north tree line of, of uh, Jessica Lloyd's property, okay? Okay. Um, they took, uh, they examined those tire tracks. Mm -hmm and uh, they have contacts in the tire business. Obviously, mm -hmm. tire tracks mm -hmm. are a major source of uh, evidence for us. Sure. Um, shortly after um, this investigation started, they identified those tires as the same uh, tires on your Pathfinder. Really? Yeah. Okay. Okay. One of, the other, uh, one of the other things that they do to try and identify the type of vehicle that may have left those tires, mm -hmm. well, is they do two things. They, they talk to witnesses, mm -hmm. okay? Um, w there was a, uh, a female police officer that actually drove by that location uh, that evening mm -hmm. and recalls seeing an SUV type vehicle in the field to the north of Jessica Lloyd's house uh, consistent with a, a Pathfinder. Okay. okay. It may be consistent with other things but consistent yeah. with a Pathfinder. Um, and they, uh, what they also do to try and identify the type of the vehicle is they look at uh, what they call the wheelbase width, mm -hmm. okay? Because different vehicles, different makes, models have wheelbase width. So yep. they can take those two sets of tire tracks, measure the distance between them, yep. okay? And determine what the uh, the width is, sure. and then they can enter that into a vehicle database and it will spit out the types of vehicles, yep. okay? Um, your Pathfinder's uh, wheelbase width is very, very close to the width of the, uh, of the tires uh, that were left in that field, mm -hmm. okay? Um, do you have any recollection at all of being off that road? I was not off the road, no. Okay. All right. Russell, um, is there anything you can think of, let's go talk about Marie Franz Como for a minute, okay? Mm -hmm. Is there any reason at all you can think of that during our investigation, obviously we're searching uh, computers, uh, uh, things like Blackberries, right? Mm -hmm. Electronic mm -hmm. devices, uh, looking through houses for things that are in handwriting, written notes, diaries, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm not at liberty to tell you what the content was, but is there any reason at all you can think of why Marie France Como would have specifically referenced you in some of her, uh, in some of her writings? Not at all. No. No, absolutely not. Okay. Is there anything that she ever said to you that led you to believe that there might be something uh, more than a passing interest with her towards you? Not at all. No, we spent you know one flight together talking. I'd go back occasionally and talk. No, I, that, if that's the case, that's a, that's very surprising. Okay. All right. Um, you have any questions for me right now? No. 
I'm just going to step out and see how things are going. Okay. okay. I mean, it is a Sunday, but there's probably 60, 70 people working on this file, so there's a mm -hmm. lot of things happening. Sure. Uh, so let me go out and see what's happening, and then I'll uh, I'll come back in and uh, we'll hopefully continue. Okay. okay. I told you when I came in here uh, that I'm going to treat you with respect, and I've asked you to do the same for me. Um, we talked about the whole idea of how we've uh, uh, approached you here. Okay. Uh, the, the trying to be as discreet as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the problem is, Russell, is every time I walk out of this room, there's another issue that comes up, okay? And it's not issues that point away from you. It's issues that point at you, okay? And I, wanna, I want you to see what I mean, mm -hmm. all right? This is the footwear impression of the person who approached the rear of Jessica Lloyd's house. Mm -hmm on the evening of the 28th and 29th of January, yeah. okay? All right, now I want you to keep in mind that this is slightly smaller, okay, in scale, okay? Okay. All right, that's not to scale. That's The footwear is actually bigger. Okay. If you look here on the ruler, you'll see that uh, one inch is just slightly smaller than an actual inch, okay? okay? But this is the way it prints off on the computer. Yeah. I'm gonna move this over so you can see what I mean, all right? Because essentially when you're dealing with footwear impressions, um, we have a gentleman on the OPP who's uh, basically world-renowned. Uh, his name is John Norman. Mm -hmm. And essentially, with footwear impressions, uh, you're in a situation where you're, you're pretty much in the area of, uh, of fingerprints, mm -hmm. okay? And essentially, what we're talking about here is, especially when you start adding in other pieces of, of uh, information that mm -hmm. uh, support uh, an investigative position, yeah. okay? This is a photocopy of the boot that uh, you took off your foot yeah. just a little while ago, okay? Yeah. Now, I'm not an expert in footwear impressions, so I rely on the experts. Footwear impressions are very much like, uh, like fingerprint comparisons, okay? You take a look at this print, and again, this is one print. This mm -hmm. person walked through, there's several different prints to compare, mm -hmm. so we're going to get features off of one print to compare, features off another print to compare. Yeah. These are identical. Okay. Your vehicle drove up the side of Jessica Lloyd's house. Your boots walked to the back of Jessica Lloyd's house on the evening of the 28th and 29th of January. Okay. You want discretion. We need to have some honesty, okay? Because this is this is getting out of control really fast, Russell really, really fast. Hmm. This is getting beyond my control. All right, I came in here a few hours ago and I called you the way I called you today because I wanted to give you the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. But you and I both know you were at Jessica Lloyd's house, and I need to know why. You need to explain it because this is the other problem we're having, Russell. Okay. Again, these decisions are made by me. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's a search warrant being executed at your residence in Ottawa. Okay. So your wife now knows what's going on. There's a search warrant being executed at the, your residence in Tweed, and your vehicle's been seized. Okay. You and I both know they're going to find evidence that links you to these situations. Okay. You and I both know that the unknown offender, male on Marie France Combo's body, is going to be matched to you, quite possibly before the evening's over. Okay. 
This is a major investigation. The Center of Forensic Science is on call 24 hours a day helping us with this. Mm -hmm. Your opportunity to take some control here and to have some explanation that anybody is going to believe is quickly expiring. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're applying, the investigators are now applying for a warrant to search your office. These aren't decisions that we can say yes or no to. This is the practical steps mm. in an investigation like this. And Russell, me for a second, okay? When that evidence comes in, when that DNA match, when that phone rings and somebody knocks on this door, mm -hmm. your credibility is gone, okay? Because this is how credibility works, all right? And I know you're an intelligent person and you probably don't need to hear this explanation, but I also know your mind's racing right now, okay? Because I've sat across a lot of people in your position over the years, mm -hmm. okay? The bottom line is, is that as soon as we get that that piece of evidence that solidifies it, mm -hmm. DNA, okay? As soon as the expert in footwear impressions, the expert in tire impressions calls and says, yes, I've examined those and they're mm -hmm. a match, mm -hmm. it's all over. Because as soon as that happens, where's your credibility? Where's your believability? You're just another, uh, and again, don't take this wrong, Okay, but you can see if you step outside this room in your mind and imagine how people are going to view you, okay, if the truth comes out after the clear evidence is presented to you, when you finally go, okay, I'm screwed now, mm -hmm. what are we going to do? Russell. You know there's only one option. What do you, what do you, what other option is there? What's the option? Well, I don't think you want the cold-blooded psychopath option. I might be wrong. Okay, because I don't get me wrong, I've met guys who actually kind of enjoyed the notoriety, got off on it. Got off on having that label. Bernardo being one of them. I don't see that in you. If I saw that in you, I wouldn't be back in here talking to you, quite frankly. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you got me fooled. I don't know. This is over. And it can have a, a bad ending where Jessica's parents continue to wonder where her daughter's lying. And I don't know. I mean, obviously, there's a huge search still underway, and it'll continue. It'll continue until her body's found. That might even happen tonight, for all I know. Once that happens, then I don't know what other cards you would have to play. So what are we going to do? Call me 
for us, please. Okay. What are we going to do, Russ? Jessica somewhere we can find her easily? Like, is this something where I can make a call and tell somebody to go to a location and they're going to find her, or is this something where we have to go and, and uh, take a walk? Which direction are we heading in here? Russ, maybe, maybe this would help. Can you tell me what the issue is you're struggling with? What's the issue you're struggling with? It's hard to believe this is happening. Why is that? Why is it hard to believe? decision was it and we're going to find out the answer to this anyway but whose decision was it to issue the, uh, the directive to the base personnel that nobody had to speak to the police and to seek legal counsel before they were questioned it's my I don't think that was my understanding that direction came from somebody that reports to you 
What do you think they're well, going to say, Russ? No, no. What do you think they're going to say? All right, and and let's let's step back for a second here, okay? I really don't think it benefits you or makes you look any better to start debating the little issues. No, right? no, but that is news to me. Okay. I have a legal officer that reports to me yeah. who may have given that direction. Okay. But that's the first time I've heard it. If that's true, okay. that's the first time I've heard that. All right, and that may be the case, but how does it look? All right. We're not even dealing with something that's really even evidence because it's not needed. I mean, when you, no, have, no, when you have DNA and all this other stuff, that's not even. What really was the an direction? Issue. I don't recall, but it was something along the lines of, of uh, telling the people on the base that they didn't, uh, they weren't required legally to speak with police and they should seek legal counsel before they decide to speak. But okay. well, if that was if that was actually said, it would not have been to the base at large. It it may have been to the individual, the uh, the boyfriend who was the suspect. Okay, that my understanding it went out to all personnel. No, absolutely. Maybe not. maybe no only under your command, I don't know. It didn't. Okay. Okay, that's I, fine. I didn't ever see it. That's fine. Now let's get back to the issue. What's that? So you talk about perception. My only two immediate concerns from a perception perspective are what my wife must be going through right now. Yeah. And the impact this is gonna have on the Canadian forces. Where do we go? Russ, is there anything you want from me? Is there anything you want me to explain? Is there something missing that you're struggling with that I can shed some light on for you? I'm struggling with how upset my life is right now. Russ, what are you looking for? I'm concerned that they're tearing apart my wife's brand new house. So am I. But if nobody tells them what's there and what's not, they don't have any choice. Computers will be brought to Microsoft in California. They'll be, they'll be picked apart. You can't erase things from computers. It doesn't happen. I'm sure you've seen that. I'm sure that's pretty common knowledge these days. It just doesn't happen. There's, they sell programs that uh, to try and help people clean their computers of stuff, and our guys are pulling that stuff out all the time. The FBI is pulling that stuff out all the time. This investigation will end up costing no less than $10 million easy and they will say no to nothing any request this major case manager makes on this case they've already been told it's approved don't even bother asking So what am I doing, Russ? I put my best foot forward here for you, but I really have. I don't. I don't know what else to do to to make make you understand the impact of what's happening here. I want to um, minimize the impact on my wife. So do I. So 
So how do we do that? Well, we start by telling the truth. Is she close to where she lives? I've got maps of that general area. Which town is she near? Why don't we start there? I'm not sure if you give me a map of um, it covers Caligar down to the highway and over to Tweed. I'll show you. Let me see what I got here. I might have something. Is she inside, outside? Biggest area I have there, Russ? Yeah, you need more. You need a real map. So, where am I going on, the, uh, on here to get to her? In this block here. Okay. So, you're pointing to. A detailed map of that area and I'll show you where she is. Okay. Is she close to a road? Yep. Alright. Um, is it something where. Is she, is she buried or is she somewhere where if you walk there you would. You would fairly easily see her. It's here. Okay. So she's south of 7, uh, east of Tweed, mm -hmm. west of 41. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's this road here? Not sure. Neither am I. Okay. I'll be right back, okay? Do you want any water or anything? Sure. Okay. I'll be right back. How long has she been there for? over a week. Was it fairly quick from the time she left? Friday night. Friday night? Yeah. So where was she between Thursday night and Friday night? In Tweed. With you? Yeah. How long was she alive for? Almost 24 hours, not quite. Russ, you're doing the right thing here. Okay. Well, again, my interest is in uh, making my, my wife's life a little easier. And okay. her family as well. Wow. We share that interest. But there's no, uh, your time in Ottawa is wasted, really. I'll tell you where the memory sick cards are. Where are they? They're in the house there, but... In Ottawa? Yeah. Whereabouts? Um, some in the camera bag, which they would have found in my office. Mm -hmm. And in the when you walk into the office on the left side, there's a um, uh, desk of uh, drawers, set okay. of drawers, like a filing cabinet, wooden, Ikea. In one of the top two drawers, and there's a plastic divider. Yeah. And there's, uh, inside there, there are two memory cards. Okay. Which are blank, but I'm sure they can be re- uh, And whose images are on those cards? Uh, well, uh, I've erased them, but I expect uh, 
be able to draw images of uh, Jessica and I. What about Marie? There may be images on there as well. And the two women from September? Yep. Okay. Do you have those images stored anywhere else? Yep. There are um, two hard drives in the house in Ottawa. I can draw you a little picture if you like. Sure. Do you want to do that now while I'm sure. getting them out? Want anything to eat or anything? Leave that with you. Okay. But I do want to talk to you again. That's the plan. Okay. I'll be right back. Can you make it up there? Somebody running around looking for an actual map, but uh, I did the same thing with uh, the Google Maps. We just blew them up a little bit more. Um. This is the this is the biggest of the area. Well, may, this might have better parameters for you. Here's Tweet. What road is that? Carry? No. South of, can't read that word, uh, East Hungerford? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Oh, there it is there. Okay. How far off the road is she? 40 feet. Is she, is she covered with anything? She's wrapped up. And she's on the surface. Just a gray something or other. Covered. Barry, the obvious question I'm going to have for you is when they go there, and they'll be there shortly, mm -hmm. they're going to find her? Oh, yeah. Okay. I'll be right back. You look like you want to say something. Just that the, this place, my wife, it's been a dream for a better part of a year, so I'm keen to get them what they need and so they can leave her alone. Okay, well, we're going to do our best to keep that as low key as possible, okay? What do you want to talk about? Because it's uh, pretty wide open now, right? Yeah. What do you want to know? Well, do you want to work forwards or backwards? Doesn't matter. Well, why don't we start with Jessica? Okay. How does that start for you? Um, I saw her in her house on her treadmill. Wouldn't stand out, I guess. Then I noticed she wasn't um, there Thursday. So I got into the house to look around. Then, um, and they left. Noticed she'd come home. So I went back in. Through the uh, back patio door. 
while she was uh, sleeping. Okay. So I woke her up. Didn't, um, didn't hit her. She only hit her once. Friday night. Well, so I raped her in uh, in her house, and then I took her to the car and took her to Tweet. And um, spent the day in Tweet. She thought we were leaving. Hit her on the back of the head. Okay. Is there anything in particular? Well, um, what did they hit on the back of the head do? Well, I was surprised that uh, her her skull gave way. She was there and immediately unconscious. Uh, I strangled her. Okay. What did you hit her with? Flashlight. Okay. In the house or outside the house? In the house. Where in the house did this happen? In the main portion, just in front of the fireplace. What do you mean they'll find signs of it? Oh, well, there's quite a bit of blood. I hadn't expected. I'd expected to knock her out. But obviously generated a lot of blood. What did she bleed onto? The floor. It's just a tile floor. Okay. Did you clean it up or did you? I, I wiped it up. I know it'll be uh, easily spotted. Well, it makes you think that? Like, if I walked in that house right well, now, would I see it? You wouldn't see it, not at all, but, uh, you know, all right, hey, so okay. we'll, uh, we'll show it, I'm sure. Okay. Um, so when that happened, was she, did she have clothes on, or was she naked? Yeah, or? she was dressed. Okay. So when we find her, is she going to have those clothes on, too? Yeah. Um, okay, uh, Marie France uh, Como. There was an open window in the basement of her, uh, her house when she was away. I went in there um, a couple of nights before uh, she came home, looked around. back in there uh, late at night when she was at home. She was on the phone in her bedroom. She actually discovered me in the basement. She was trying to get her cat to come upstairs and the cat was in the basement had seen me and was fixated on me in the corner. She couldn't get the cat up so uh, she came downstairs trying to get the cat, and uh, I'm not sure why she uh, came.
came over to me, I guess the cat was staring at me, and she was wondering what the cat was staring at. The lights were on. So when she spotted me, I uh, had the same flashlight. I subdued her. Tied her up, brought her upstairs. And uh, strangled her later in the morning. Well, more suffocated her. Right. Some tape. How did you subdue her? And when you say subdued her in the basement, what did you do? Well, I had the same flashlight, and um, you know, she she saw me right away. So I was just uh, hit her a couple of times and around her head, try and knock her out. Didn't, but um, she was bleeding a little bit. struggled, subdued her. Okay. Any blood from, from that struggle? Oh yeah. No, not, not a whole bunch, but uh, a flashlight did break her skin a couple of times. Okay. What area of the basement did that take place in? I was hiding behind the furnace. So she spotted me right there. Okay. Did she recognize you? No, I had uh, stuff on my face. Okay. Um, so then you go upstairs and you said uh, she suffocated? Well, I suffocated her. I put tape on her. Uh, I put tape on her mouth. so she couldn't breathe. Okay. Um, what kind of tape was it? Duct tape. What happened to it? Uh, well, I took it with me and Did you use tape for any other purposes? No. Okay. Um, did she ever recognize you through this whole episode? No. What did you say you had on your face? I had just a, a cover for my head, just a, you know, a sports you know, pullover tape. Like just a little cap kind of thing. Okay. Just a. I think you know, a lycra or something. And a um, just a headband over my nose and mouth, so it covered most everything but my eyes. Okay. Um. Now yeah, this flashlight. Where is that now? In the house? Yeah. What kind of flashlight is it? It's a red uh, 3 double D. Um, I'm not sure what brand it is, but it's a metal, you know, one of these aluminum. It's like a big, um, I don't remember what brand of you know, aircraft aluminum flashlights are, you see a lot of them. Anyway, it's a big, bigger one of those. 
Um, did you take anything out of uh, Marie France's house or Jessica Lloyd's house? Uh, yeah, some of their uh, underwear. Okay. That's all. And where is that? Um, it's in some boxes in the basement here in Ottawa, in that rec room. So we just moved in, so there are boxes everywhere. So on the same side as the furnished room, sort of the back against the wall. Okay. What do the other boxes look like? Um, I think one's a scanner, the box for my scanner. Mm -hmm. They're they're all right next to each other. So a quick look through the boxes there will find them. Okay. How much underwear is in those boxes? Sixty pieces or so total. All women's. Yeah, sixty pieces of theirs. Of whose? Of Jessica's and uh, Mary France. So you took sixty pieces from between the two of them. Yeah. Okay. I think so. All right. Um, and they're in a, like when you talk about a scanner, is it a computer scanner box? Well, a computer scanner is up in the office, and its box is down in the basement. So okay, it's inside that box. Does any of the underwear in those boxes belong to anyone other than Marie Franz or uh, or Jessica? Um, yeah, there's some from each of the other two women. Okay. Uh, why don't we talk about those two women? Mm -hmm. um, so the first one happened on the 16th, and I don't know why I can't recall their names, but uh, the lady that was uh, lived closer to you. No, Lori was closer to me. Okay. So the first, uh, the first one, mm -hmm. I had just spotted her from our boat, actually. And I got into the house while she was uh, asleep. Notice that she was alone. And uh, just hit her with my hand while she was sleeping. Subdued her. Mostly just my weight on top of her. Um, had her take off her pajamas, took some pictures, took some of her underwear and left. And the other woman? Same kind of deal. Went in through the back of the house. She was sleeping in her, um, not in her bedroom, but in her, you know, in front of the TV. Very much the same story. Anything different about that story? I mean, pretty much the same story and exactly the same story are two different things, right? Yeah, no, uh, not much different at all. Um, I did have the flashlight that time. I had her with the flashlight. And thinking it would knock her out. It did. So, and I subdued her with my weight. Took her off her clothes, took some pictures, and left. Why do you think these things happen? Have you spent much time thinking about that? About why? Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know the answers. And I'm pretty 
pretty sure the answers don't matter. Well, let me let me ask you this: Did you like or dislike these women? I didn't know any of them. Okay. I had met Maddie Franz that one time in that in her uh, airplane. Okay. No, I guess, I guess when, yeah, when you're going through these things, um, are you? Well, well, let me let's talk about Jessica because she was there with you for the whole day, right? Mm -hmm. What kind of feelings were you experiencing while you were with her that day? She was a very nice girl. Can you tell me why you killed her? Right. Do you know why you killed her? Well, I think I killed her because I knew that uh, Her story would be recognized. Her story would be recognized? How do you mean? Well, because she knew I was taking pictures. Mm -hmm. So because of the um, two um, stories in Tweed, So if you didn't take pictures, what would you have done with her? I don't know. I mean, she's at your house, right? Um, well, let, let me ask you this. Is it uh, two lived, right, and two died? What's, what was the difference in your mind between... Well, the... Uh, the attention the first two got, um, was very much fo focused on, obviously, or for obvious reasons, uh, the pictures I took. So anybody else telling stories about pictures, right, would have been a fairly straight line. But when, when this thing happened with Marie Franz, it was, was, did you believe that you were already a suspect for what happened in Tweet? No. So what, what were you concerned about? Well, because um, I was pretty sure that, uh, you know, that she was serving military, right? Mm -hmm. It would have been, uh, it would have been difficult for investigators to ignore that connection. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Um, Let's go back to Jessica then, okay? Um, you see her on the Wednesday night, okay? On her treadmill? Mm -hmm. How do you see her? She was in the basement, window wide open, on her treadmill. So I drove by. Okay. Did you, did you stop to look at the house, or how, do, how does that catch your eye as you drive by? Looking to see who was, who was where. Don't know that area very well, so I was just keeping my eyes open. Okay. So you spot her on the Wednesday. Yeah. Um, do you just keep on going, or do you just stop and 
take a closer look that yeah. night or anything? No? Okay. And you went back on the Thursday night, right? Yep. So you go back on the Thursday night and you went you went into the house before she came home? She was out. Okay. Um, yeah, she was out. Got in through the kitchen window. It's unlocked. Everything else was locked. Okay. So you're in there doing what? Looking around. Looking around to see who lived in the house. It was just her. Okay. And then what do you do? Well, I left the house. And, uh, and then she came home. Very long. So I watched for a little bit to see if she was alone. She was. And I went in and she went back to sleep. I just went to sleep. Okay. So you go in. She's sleeping. And what do you do? Well, I, I snuck up to the side of her bed, expecting to uh, try to knock her out. She woke up, but she did as I said. I didn't hit her. What did you say? I said, lie down on your tummy. Okay. She did. I tied her up. What did you tie her up with? Some uh, rope I brought. So she's on her stomach. How are you tying her up? Just tying her hands behind her back. Okay. She got clothes on at that point? Mm-hmm. What kind of clothes? Sweats. All right. You tie her hands behind her back, and then then what happens? I took her clothes off. Okay. And then what happened? Rape can mean a lot of different things. Uh, what kind of sexual act it took place? Just, uh, vaginal and oral. Okay. Oral. Who was performing the oral sex? Um, no, me on her and her on me. Any uh, any condoms used or anything like that? No. No. So, the, and again, correct me if I'm wrong. Vaginal intercourse. Uh, her playing, performing oral sex on you, and you performing oral sex on her. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what order those things occurred in? Yeah. I uh, started with the oral sex. Then I raped her, and then later on I made her form moral sex on me. Okay. Anything, any kind of conversation happening when this is going on? Yeah, a little bit. What was being said? 
I threatened her before she, uh, before I had her perform oral sex. What did you say? Well, I put a zip tie around her neck. I said uh, that I would pull it if I didn't like what uh, she would do. Okay. So she did what you told her to do? Mm hmm Any issues there? Any reason to pull it? No. So do you remember if you ejaculated at that point? Or at any point? Um, not at that point, but later on. Okay. So the oral sex finishes, and then what happens next? Well, I continued um, to rape her, and I had her put on some of her underwear. Took some pictures. Lots of pictures. And then uh, got her dressed. Walked back to the truck. Okay. At what point did you decide that she was going to leave with you? I'm not sure. That wasn't um, necessarily always the plan. At some point, uh, I was there for three, three hours, three and a bit. Okay. Um, do you remember the conversation about leaving? Was there any? Did she say anything about that, or? What was she saying um, to you? She was, um, certainly cooperative. Okay. A cooperative can mean a number of different things. Was she excited about leaving with you? I, mean, I don't want to be sarcastic, but, um. Oh, no, she just didn't put up too much of a fuss. Did she try and negotiate with you at all, or? I don't know. What did she say? Well, I told her that I would uh, let her go later on. Okay. So when you take her out of your house, is she is she still bound, or? Yep. How how is that done? Just uh, hands behind her back. Okay. What about her feet? Anything there? No, she was walking freely. Okay. Barefoot or? No, no, she had those brown suede shoes on that had been reported. Okay. So where does she sit in your truck when you get to the truck? Front seat, passenger side. Okay. And where do you go? Straight to Tweed. Straight to your house in Tweed or straight yeah. to just the town? To the house. No stops anywhere? No. Okay. What time do you remember what time you arrived there? I don't exactly, but I'd say between 4.30 and 5.30. Okay. All right. When you were, uh, when you were first there before she came home, do you remember, did anybody come to the door at all when you were in the house? I think somebody had come home, uh, somebody had come to the house just before she did, because I thought it was her, but then they left. I was outside at the time. Did you see who that person was, or what kind of vehicle they were no. in, or anything? No. Saw the lights, and I assumed it was her, and then all of a sudden they left, so I don't know what happened. Okay. Um, where were you when that first vehicle pulled up? In the back. Back here. So you didn't have a view of the vehicle, you could just tell that there was a vehicle there, is that fair? Okay. So you get home, what, 4.35 you say? Hmm. Okay. And then
And then what happens? Uh, well, she um, she just go to the bathroom, and uh, had a quick shower, wash her, and we went to, into my bedroom. sleep a little bit. She was tied up. How was she tied up at that point? So I, the other I put um, tape over her eyes from the beginning. So that's what she did. Okay. When they find her, is that tape going to be there? Or was it ever removed? What kind of tape? Duct tape. All right. The duct tape that you used, where's the, where's that roll? Uh, it's all gone. It, um, I used it to, I used the rest of it to uh, bind her, bind her body. So by all gone, is it is it with the body now? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you said, who went to sleep when you came home? You, you had a sh or she had a shower? Well, we both got in. I washed her off after she'd been to the bathroom. We both went to sleep. But she was tied up, and I tied the rope. You know, so I could fall asleep a little bit, and she could move without waking me up. Okay, I'm trying to picture how that would be. So the rope's tied to what on her? Just tied her hands. Behind her back. Okay. And it and then the rope just wrapped around me a couple of times, so there was no slack. Okay. Do you remember how long you slept for? Not long, maybe a couple hours. Do you know if she slept? I don't know. Okay. So you wake up and, and it wasn't I mean we were up and down, up and down. So it wasn't two hours straight, it was about two hours in bed, but wasn't much sleep, just lying there probably. So you wait, you get up from that, and, and what happens next? Um, she had a seizure, actually. She felt it coming on, and. Um, because she'd had some before. Lasted uh, not quite a while. Got her dressed into the uh, family room and anyway, she uh, she recovered. She got uh, yeah, it was obviously stress, but uh, yeah, probably probably went on for about fifteen minutes. Sort of it. So, yeah. how do you know she had them before? She told me. Did she tell you why she gets them? Well, she suggested it was stress. Yeah, so she felt herself you know, start to tense up and said she thought she was going to have a seizure. You know, so she was, she was, it was, you know, convulsions is what she was saying. So she reco recovered from that? Yep, she, um, went, I stayed with her and talked her through it and make sure she didn't bite her tongue. Okay. And then what happened? 
Oh, let me have a little lie down right there because she was obviously exhausted. Put a cover over her and went to sleep. Wait for an hour or so. And I had told her um, earlier that before I let her go, I wanted to take some pictures of her in her underwear. And uh, have sex with her. So after she'd had uh, a rest for an hour or so, number of different outfits she had. I'm sorry? Put on a number of, you know, pairs, panties, bra that she had. Okay. Got taken from theirs. So she put those on and I took pictures. Okay. Are you in any of these pictures? Yep. What, what kind of what kind of images are you in? Um, well, I'm with her. There's on the hard drives. You'll see there's video as well. So there's video of the. Um, Almost four hours, I guess. Of what? Well, of uh, initially at her place of uh, raping her. So I was running the video and then taking still pictures. So the video pretty much covers everything. Did you use video at other places? Uh, at uh, Mali France's as well. Okay. And is that video on the hard drives? Yeah. Same type of uh, activity? Yeah. Okay. Although I didn't have her put on any. So Jessica poses for these pictures and there's videos and um, and then what happens? Then um, I got her dressed because she thought she was leaving. Up by tea. Fruit. And then as we were walking out, uh, I struck her on the back of the head. Okay. When did you decide to do that? Well, I was uh, pretty sure that I wasn't going to let her leave, but um, you know, the idea of striking her on the head was developed in the afternoon. And what was that strike supposed to accomplish in your mind? What was the intent of, of doing that? Well. I thought I would be able to knock her out, and then I was I was going to strangle her. Okay. So when you actually do strike her, what, what's the result? Her skull gave way a little bit. Felt like, and there was a lot of blood, so I think that's what happened. She was immediately unconscious.
and then I um, strangled her. How'd you strangle her? Uh, the same rope. Just put her on her neck. Okay. While well, she was uh, unconscious. Now, what happened to the zip tie that was around her neck earlier? I took it off. Uh, Did you take it off before you put the rope around her neck, or, or after, or do you remember? After she was dead. Oh, okay. So the zip tie was around her neck while you used the rope? Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you leave the rope around her neck? No. Okay. And how did you know she was dead? She... Um stop moving. Okay. So what did you do after that? I, uh, I bound her up. To a, there's a fetal position. Cleaned up the floor. No, you say you bound her up. Is that, are you referring to the duct tape that you talked about earlier? Yeah. Okay. So then, what did you? I um, put her in the garage. It was very cold. And then I went into the base. Okay. Why'd you go to the base? Pardon me? Why'd you go to the base? Because I was flying early the next morning. Okay. So what time did you leave to go to the base? I told you about between 9 and 10 or so. On the Friday night? Yep. Okay. So you fly and... Then I drove home to Ottawa. So which night would you... Saturday night. So you land uh, and... Uh, what time are you landing? 6, 6.30. Okay. Saturday night. Did you go by the house in Tweed on your way to Ottawa? Or? No. Um, so you drove straight home to yeah. Ottawa? What time did you get there at? Do you remember? Sometime before midnight. I can't quite remember, but uh, I think I went in the office first, did some work. So I think I got home to Ottawa just before midnight. So I, think. I think. Not sure. I. I slept for a little bit in, at the Tim Hortons in Brockville. So it might be later. I honestly can't remember when I got out of it. Okay. Yeah. Midnight ish, Saturday. Mm hmm. So you get home. You're in Ottawa, what do you do? You go to, go to bed or yeah. stay up? Okay. So then what do you do the next day? Well, my wife and I did some stuff. I can't remember what uh, what was going on that day. You know, putting together the new house. And I headed back to Tweed that night. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Sorry. Um, no, I did. I had uh, I had Monday off. 
That's right. I had Monday off, and then I was visiting uh, one of the units in Ottawa on Tuesday. So I didn't head back to Tweed till Tuesday night. Okay. <coughs> Get back to Tweed, and what happens next? I uh, took Jessica's body to that spot. Okay. That happened on Tuesday night? Just this past Tuesday, obviously. Yeah. Okay. Do you remember what time that was? It was pretty late. It was uh, midnight ish. I'd say between midnight and one. On, uh, Wednesday morning. Okay. Um, what made you decide to, to measure that distance, that point seven kilometers? That's just the way I am. Numbers. I have to know the numbers. Okay. And um, how did you leave her? I just left her tucked behind a, uh, a fairly large rock. Okay. Is that duct tape still on her? Mm -hmm. um, and what else is on her? A couple of towels wrapped around her head. And uh, the top and pants she was wearing, jeans. Okay. Did you ever go back there? Um, what other type of cleaning and things like that did you do? Anything else to kind of cover your tracks that you can think of? I vacuumed the house and I uh, wiped the, the floor, washed the floor. Okay. What about your truck? Did you do anything with that? Just the wash today because it was a mess and vacuum. Um, so Marie Franz, when did, uh, when did it first occur to you to go to her house? Uh, well, probably in October, October, November, not quite sure, but somewhere in that time frame. And do you, re you remember why you that you thought to um, to do that? Uh, well, you know, she had said she lived alone when the one time I met her. Mm -hmm. trying to understand like, why her versus you know the dozens of other women you probably come across on a daily basis I don't know yeah, I, mean. yeah I, I went up there uh, when she wasn't home just to see where she lived and When did you do that? A couple of nights before. How did you know her address? Well, is there another role for the base? Right? Okay. So when you go out there a couple of nights before, do you remember what night that was? When you were there, first time? I don't. Uh, but I, it was within two or three nights, I think. Okay. Probably, well, no more than four, anyway, something like that. And did you actually go into her house on that occasion, or did you? Uh, okay. So what happened that night? How'd you how'd you get into her house? This window in the side of the basement, side window. 
Okay. Just to back step a bit, how did you get to her house that, that first night you went there? I drove. What did you drive? Uh, I think I drove my truck. What kind of finder? Do you remember where you parked it? Yep, I parked it um, a bit of a division in the residential areas there. I parked it on another side. Six, seven hundred meters away. Okay. So not on her street, on mm -hmm. a different street? Do you remember what street you parked on? No, but it's uh, actually it might be the same street, but there's an interruption in the street where there's a construction zone. So there's a pathway in between. So I think it's probably the same street. Okay. So uh, you go to her house, and when you went there that night, did you know that she was away? Uh, I'm not sure if I knew entirely, but I, I, I think I thought she was away. Okay. Is that based on her schedule, or, or how would how would you know? Uh, that? Well, my yeah, because I fly with the squadron, and I have access to the schedule and. Okay. It's a slightly different schedule she has, but that's probably how I know. You don't know for sure? I think that's probably how I know. Okay. So you go to her house, mm -hmm. and what do you do that night, the first night? I looked around and uh, I make sure that she was living there alone. And I'm sorry, did you say, I can't remember if you said, how, how did you get in? Same, same way, about side basement window. Side basement window, okay. Do you remember what kind of window it is, like what made it? Uh, well, I just noticed it was, well, I noticed the flashlight, I could see that it was not locked, it had been open slightly. So I removed the screen, slid it open, went in. Okay. So you go in and uh, you're in her house? Figuring out she lives alone, and uh, do you do anything that night? Yeah, I was playing with her uh, underwear. What do you mean playing with her underwear? Huh. Wearing it. Okay. Doing anything else? stuff. What do you mean you didn't touch her stuff? I mean, you touched her underwear, but... but yeah, yeah. So. But nothing else. Okay. Did you take any of the underwear with you that night? Yeah, a few pieces. And where did you find the underwear when you went in? In her drawer. Was it clean? Was it used? Okay. Um, anything else you can remember doing that evening? That you no. All right. So um, after that first visit, did you return again before meeting up with her? No. Okay. So which day did you go to her house when she was there? Well, the night before I went to Ottawa, so I think that was Monday night. Okay. All right. Um, so let's walk through that. Uh, what time do you think you got there? About 11 or so, probably. 10, 30, 11. Okay. Yep, so she was on the phone in her room. hear that uh, from the backyard. I got in through the uh, side window. The same basement window? Mm -hmm. How could you hear from the backyard? What was... Uh, Just hear her on the phone. From beside, beside the house. 
hear through the walls that she was on the phone. Okay. Any idea who she was talking to or what she was talking about? No. Couldn't hear that well. Okay. So you go in through the basement window. And what are you wearing when this is happening? Sweatshirt and dockers, I guess. And the uh, two pieces on my head. Okay. And where are those two pieces now? Pieces that you wore on the head? Uh, they're probably in my bag, in uh, my luggage bag, in Edison, the bedroom. What does your luggage bag look like? It's a blue duffel bag type thing. It's right beside the bed. Okay. Is it the only blue duffel bag in your bedroom? Mm -hmm. Um And these pieces, what do they look like again? It's a blue headband. Okay. Standard blue you know, winter headband. And uh, black skull cap type. Any insignias or anything on them? Yeah, there are, but I don't know what they are. The blue headband has something stands, uh, yeah, stitched, a, a name of some sort stitched on it. And the uh, skull cap has some sort of emblem, on, white emblem on the black. I don't know what it is. Are they like sports emblems or company emblems? or? Uh, it's the manufacturers. Okay. Anything else in that blue uh, duffel bag? I don't think so. Is it full of, of things? Other just, than just my clothes. Okay. Um, so you go in. Do uh, you remember what you had on your feet? In the house there? When oh, you went to Marie France's house. Uh, probably running shoes. There wasn't snow on the ground. Okay. So you go in, and you're in the basement. And uh, whereabouts in the basement are you? Um, by the furnace. Okay. And what are you doing? Like, what, uh, what's your, what's your sort of plan at that point? I was waiting for you to go to bed. Okay. And how long did that take? Well, she didn't. And then she came down looking for the cat. All right. And uh, what happens next? Well, as I described, I subdued her. I gave her the flashlight. But essentially, wrestled her to the ground and tied her up. And what did you use to tie her up? Same rope, green rope. It's in tweed. Is it just green or like uh, how long is this piece of rope? It's probably uh, 20 feet. It's, it's a boat, boat rope. It's got some red specks in it, I think. Okay. Is there lots of ropes in tweed or is this probably the only rope? No, this, uh, there are two, two lengths. Two lengths of the same green rope? Mm -hmm. And were they both used? Uh, well, I, I only ever had one with me, so I don't know if I used the same piece both times or not, but only two lengths of rope. Okay. So you tie her, tie her up. How did you tie her up when you, after you subdued her? And what is she wearing at that point? She wasn't wearing anything to start with. So when she came down to the basement, she had no clothes on? Mm -hmm. She had some sort of a shawl over her shoulder. Okay. And she immediately dropped when she saw me. Did she say anything when she saw you? She did. She called out, you bastard. Okay. And then what happened? 
then I subdued her as I described. By hitting her with that red flashlight? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, they were more glancing. Glancing blows cut her skin, but weren't doing much else. Okay. She fell over, and then I subdued her. And she tripped. How did you tie her at that point? Like, I know you used the rope, but what, were you, what did you tie her up, up like? Just told her to put her, I like, pulled her hands behind her back and just you know, tied her wrists together. Okay. And then, then what happened after that? Then I took her upstairs. Did she go upstairs under her own power, or did you carry her? No, she passed out um, on the stairs, and then I carried her up. Why do you think she passed out? I expect uh, from the hits to her head. So you carried her up to where? To her bedroom, put her on the bed. Okay. And... Then what happened? Uh, well, as I described, I think I uh, on the bed. I raped her over a period of time. Okay, and again, just to be specific, what, what sex acts took place? Just vaginal. Your penis and her vagina? Yeah. Any condom use? No. Did you ejaculate? No. Did you ejaculate at any point with her? No. Okay. Um, but just before I forget, you I think I asked you, don't mean to bounce around on you here, Russ, but with Jessica, I asked you about ejaculation. You said you didn't at that point. When did you ejaculate with Jessica? Um, the second time or third time that I had her uh, for oral sex. And was that at her residence or yours? Hers. Okay. Any other times that you ejaculated with her? When you ejaculated with Jessica, did you use anything to clean up or? No. no. What happened to the ejaculate? She swallowed it. Okay. Um, so getting back to Marie Franz, it's just straight vaginal sex, no condom, no ejaculation. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, how long does that go for? Like how long were you engaged in that activity? Uh, a couple, well, hour and a half, two hours, I guess. Okay. And then what happens next? Well, as I described, I suffocated her using um, duct tape. Why did you decide to, to do that? Well, again, because of the pictures. As I described to you, it would have, um, it was going to be a pretty straight line back to Tweed. Okay. But why, why, why did you decide to use that method versus something else I had uh, thought about strangling her earlier that's on the video what is It was a short, short-lived attempt because she struggled quite a bit. And then I 
decided that I needed to suffocate her. So it was a short-lived attempt at strangling her? And what's on the video, the suffocation or the strangling? Well, just me putting my hand on her throat. And then her uh, responding. Yeah. No surprise, very aggressively. Okay. Any videos of the... Uh, suffocation part or pictures of that? Um, now you, you mentioned that you brought the rope with you. Where did the duct tape come from? I brought it. Okay. And what did you do with it afterwards? I think it, uh, it, it stayed in tweed. What color of duct tape are we talking about? I know it comes in a variety of colors. But Gray. Gray. Um, so before uh, the suffocation, um, obviously, how, how long do you think you were with her from the point, well, how long do you think you were in that house from the point you went in that window to the point you left? Probably um, four hours. Okay. So... Correct me if I'm wrong, did you say you were that got there at 11? Or around 11? I think that's right. Okay. So you left around 3 in the morning? Well, I was in the basement for quite a while before she came down. Right? She wasn't going to bed. So I was probably in the basement for 30, 40 minutes. Okay. So... By the time she saw me, it was probably closer to midnight. All right. Um, but I didn't have a watch on, so I'm not sure. Any gloves? I don't think so. Did you wear gloves with Jessica? Uh, only to get in the house. It's a very cold night. Okay. And what about the two women in uh, in Tweed? No gloves. So while you're with Marie Franz, what kind of conversations are taking place? You, anything in it she said to you stick out in your mind? When did you tape her mouth? As soon as I got her up to the bedroom. Okay. Why did you decide to do that? Because she was uh, you know, quite aggressive. In what I way? Was, I was confident she was, uh, would have screened, given the chance. What way was she did initially? Did she? Okay. In the basement. So in what way was she aggressive? Well, just in, you know, when she discovered me, she was very vocal, screamed quite a bit, until I subdued her, so I expected she would scream again, give the chance. Okay. Do you remember how you left her residence? door. Patio door. Okay. Did you take anything with her that night? Some of her underwear. Anything else? No. All right. Um, did you do anything else to try and uh, cover your tracks with me, Franz? I had turned off my Blackberry before I left Trent. Other than that, no. Do you remember trying to destroy any kind of evidence there, that, or anything you thought may have uh, produced evidence or anything? 
Oh, I took her sheets off the bed and ran them through the laundry. Okay. Like the laundry where? At In her house. Okay. Did you run them completely through? Did you wait for it to finish or? No, I just put them in and put a whole bunch of bleach in and let it go. Okay. So the night you went to her house and got there at 11, you came from where? You said you left Trenton. You yeah. turned off your Blackberry. Did you, are you talking about the base, or are you talking about uh, where did you leave to go to her house? Well, no, I just turned off my Blackberry before I left the Trenton area. Um, I would have left from the base after work. All right. When did you turn? When did you? Uh, what time do you think you turned your Blackberry off? Well, it's only a half hour drive to Brighton, so, you know, probably in the 9, 9.30 range. Okay. Do you remember what, uh, what time you would have turned it back on? When I was back on the 401 heading to Ottawa the next morning. What time would that have been? So, six plus or minus 30 minutes. Okay. So you leave her house, three-ish. No, I, I think it was later than that, so the four hours obviously was, I think, uh, yeah, so I think it went in about 11, was in the basement for quite a while, probably left her house closer to 4, 4.30, somewhere in there. Okay. And where do you go? Uh, I drove to Ottawa. Straight to Ottawa? Did you go by your house in Tweed or anything, or did you just go straight? No. Remember what route you took? Uh, yeah, 401, but from her place, uh, I think I went straight north on uh, whatever the road is that goes straight through Brighton up to the 401, hit the 401 and headed east. Okay. And so you're going to, what's the meeting you're having? That day in Ottawa, remind me. It's a meeting on uh, the C-17 acquisition project. Okay, and who ran that meeting? The project manager, Miss uh, Sue Hale. Okay. Is that the only meeting around that time period you would have went to on that issue with Sue Hale? Hmm? There wasn't like a weekly meeting or anything like that? Okay. No, this is sort of a quarterly. All right. Um, so the night you went, the night this happened, um, where did you park uh, that night? As I said, across the gravel little roadway, probably, it's probably the same road. Okay. Similar location to the first night? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Alright. Same, same vehicle? All right. Um, okay, well, let's talk about uh, the, well, seeing as we're going backwards in time here, why don't we talk about the second incident in Tweed um, with uh, Lori Masakai when it's uh, a 76 Cozy Cove. How did you... Uh, decide on her. I knew she lived alone. That's it. And how did you know that? Because she was three doors down and uh, didn't know her, but I knew she was pretty alone. She had a boyfriend and hadn't seemed to be, hadn't been around. So. in the window and she was alone. So she she had a boyfriend but he wasn't it too wasn't frequent? Okay. Well he was she told me that they were fighting so that's why he hadn't been there. Okay. So um, did you look in her house before the night that this 
this incident happened, or when did you do yep. that? I had been in the, within the week, probably a couple of nights earlier. What did you do that night? I um, I looked around to see if there are any permanent signs of her boyfriend. I guess took. Uh, one or two pieces of underwear. That's all. Okay. So the night you go there, um, when the incident happens, do uh, you remember what time that was? It was pretty late. Um, I probably got into the house around midnight. She was asleep on the couch. Well, I didn't know that, but I knew she was in there. And how'd you get in, sorry? A uh, window in the back of the house. There's a little sunroom. Was it just something you had to slide, or, or how did you I get that? I the screen and, uh, and slide it up. Okay. So I got into the house, and uh, she was asleep in front of the TV. Wearing anything on your face that night? Yeah, same things. Okay. The headband and the uh, the cap? Okay. Um, what kind of clothes did you have on? Just dark sweatshirt or pants. All right. So she's asleep on the couch, you're in there, and then what happens? We have been through this, eh? I know. I struck her with the uh, flashlight, thinking it would knock her out. It didn't. We struggled. I subdued her. Took some pictures. Left. It's probably in the house about two and a half hours. That's a pretty short description for two and a half hours. Well, yeah, we talked. I, uh, I, um, I told her that there were other guys in the house robbing her. My job was just to control her. What did she say to that? Did she say that, or did you just assume that? No, no, she said that. She was... She was worried she was going to be killed. I said, I'm not going to kill him. What did you do with... Uh, you said you took pictures of her. Um, clothed, unclothed? Uh, both. Clothed, actually, and then unclothed. Are you in any of those pictures? I don't think so. You just took them of her? What kind of camera are you using, by the way? What, uh, it's a digital uh, Sony. You just have the one camera? Yeah. And the video camera. Also, they're two separate? Yeah. Well, some cameras take, take video, right? Um, and where is the camera and the di and the video camera? In Tweed. Okay. Is it the only camera and video camera in that house? Yep. Okay. All right. Um, so you take pictures of her, and how do you end up leaving? Like you. Uh,
before she called the police. Okay. And did you leave immediately, or did you stay there for a while, oh, no, no. see what she was going to do? Or? I left. Okay. Um, and where do you go? Home. Straight home? Mm -hmm. okay. Did you Did you wait to see if the police showed up or anything? or? No. Well, I mean, it's, you know, so what did you do when you got home? A couple hundred feet. I went to sleep. Okay. And what did you do the next day? Went to work. Normal time. Okay. A couple hours later. All right. Um, do you remember how uh, her clothing was removed? Because her hands were tied behind her back, I think I cut off her top and then pulled off her bottom. What did you use to cut her top? Um, I can't remember if it was a knife or like a folding exacto knife or Leatherman or one of the two. Are these items that are in your house in Tweet? Was there ever any other time you used a, a, a knife to cut off clothing or anything else? Do you remember? I cut off Jessica's uh, top with a knife. So her hands were tied behind her back. That's all. Okay. Where's that knife? Which knife did you Some use? That was the leather. That was leather? Tweed. Is it the only Leatherman in, in Tweed? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so on the 16th of September, uh, when you went in that night, was that the first time you've been in her house? Yeah. Okay. And why her? Just because I'd seen her and she was cute. That's it. Okay. So there was no... Um, you didn't go into her house before that, that night? No. All right. Um, so you go in, and how'd you get into her house? Side window. The, uh, was not locked. Cut the screen, slid the window, curled in. Okay. And, uh, what you're wearing? Same. Sweatshirt, dark pants. And the same hat and... Mm -hmm. Uh, and where do you find, uh... In bed, asleep. Okay. And what do you do? Stood over her for a while and I, uh, hit her on the left side of her head, just with my hand. Just woke her up. We struggled. You know, just lay on her. like I described a little bit ago. Took off her, pulled her top down, and took off her pants. Took some pictures, left. Do you remember her saying anything to you? Yes. What did she say to you? Well, all kinds of things. Um, you know, she had a, a young baby, just a, uh, Next door, the other room, eight months or so. She's so obviously concerned about the baby. Concerned for herself, I assured her I was not going to hurt her. Physically, you know. Any underwear taken from mm -hmm. or Lori? Yep, both. And where would they be located? In Tweed. Okay. And why are they in Tweed as opposed to uh, um, 
Marie Franz and Jessica's underwear. Remember how much of their underwear you took? Um, not very much from Lori. Did they know that you took their underwear? I don't know. You didn't discuss it with them or anything? Um, so where in Tweed would their underwear be? the same duffel bag? Is there anything else in that duffel bag? Just underwear. Okay. Um, when these when these uh, pictures uh, are looked at, uh, you talked about being in Marie Franz's underwear on the first night you went in. Did you take photographs of that? What about anybody else's underwear? Yep. Photos. Of you in their underwear? Mm hmm And where were those photos taken? Uh, well, sometimes in... in, in Marie France's case, in her house. The other's in my house. In Tweet? Mm -hmm. So is this a matter you would take the underwear, go back, and, and then at some point put the underwear on and take pictures? What about Jessica's underwear? Uh, she's only her friend. So you don't have pictures of you and her? Or? No. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Well, I guess uh, I just have a, a couple of questions for you. I mean, I'm sure there's going to be more questions, but I guess what's on my mind right now, uh, Russ, is um, what made you decide to, to tell me this tonight? Mostly uh, to make my wife's life easier. Okay. Is what you've told me tonight the truth? Yeah. Okay. How do you feel about what you've done? Like what? Uh, ask you this, if, um, if this didn't come to the point it's at right now, if for whatever reason you didn't end up on our, on our radar, so to speak, uh, do you think it would have happened again? I was hoping not, but I can't answer the question. Okay. Um, not too much here, Russ, just a, a few details that I wanted to cover off, um, specifically dealing with Marie Franz. Um, in the basement of her house, uh, 
there's a hole in the uh, drywall. Do you recall how that happened? Whereabouts? Uh, I don't know specifically, but it's downstairs. I don't remember. Do you remember doing anything with her in the basement uh, where you may have used some clothing or something to uh, to secure her? Yeah, I tied her up against one of the uh, poles in the basement initially. I went outside and put the screen back on and secured the window. Okay. While she was tied to the pole? Yep. And what was your thinking behind doing that at that point? just to cover up how I'd come in. Okay. Um, now, by the time she's tied to that pole, is that in the very initial few minutes kind of thing of the confrontation? or That was shortly after I'd subdued her and tied her up, yes. Okay. Does she have the duct tape on her mouth yet? I think probably. Okay. The pictures will show it. All right. Now, in the upstairs bathroom, by her bedroom, there's uh, looks like something's occurred in there. Do you remember that? Yep. What happened there? She had passed out on the bed, and I had gone to look out the front window, see if anybody was coming. And uh, she got up and closed the bedroom door and raced into the bathroom trying to uh, get somebody's attention but her mouth was taped and her hands were tied. Okay. What did you do as a result of that? Well, I just got in and subdued her again and got, got her back into the bedroom. Okay. Didn't do anything, just regain control of her. Okay. If I remember correctly, there's a bit, there's a bit of blood in there. Do you know where that blood would have, how that, that would have occurred? All the blood was from the initial hits as I was trying to subdue her. Okay. Her skin breaking with the uh, blows to her head. Okay. Do you recall blood being in the bathroom? No, actually, I didn't have a light on there, but it didn't surprise me. Okay. Um, there's a pair of underwear and some socks on the floor of that bathroom that belonged to her. Do you, do you remember how they got there? I do don't you remember seeing them? see them. But what do you recall doing to her breasts? It's pretty clear that there was some something happened to her breasts. Do you remember what that might have been? Mm, no, I, I certainly touched her breasts. I didn't do anything to hurt them. I remember that. No. Okay. All right. Um, well, Russell. Now, when I suffocated her, she was on her 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 front, so may have been something there, but... What do you mean? Well, she was lying on the floor in the bedroom as I suffocated her and obviously struggled. may have been in there that something happened, but I didn't do anything specific to her breasts. Okay. So, when you suffocate her, that's when you have the duct tape over her mouth and nose? Mm -hmm. And that's on the floor? Yeah. And um, then what happens after that? Well, she died, and I... Um, and took the duct tape off her head and put her on the bed and covered her up with the duvet. Okay. And what was your thinking behind doing that? Uh, really. Okay. Um, as you might expect, your arrest. Uh, Certainly, uh, even now, one of the uh, Ottawa investigators mentioned to me that um, there's a number of incidents that uh, that have gone unsolved over the years. <coughs> can I, uh, I was going to get into that, can I go to the washroom quickly? Yeah, I can get somebody to take you to the washroom. Okay. After nightfall, Colonel Russell Williams was formally arrested for the murders of Marie France Como and Jessica Lloyd. He was also charged for the sexual assaults of Lori Massacott and Jane Doe. He was read his rights. He declined to be represented by an attorney. Detective Sergeant Smith gave Williams a pad of paper and a pen. He suggested to Williams that he should write a few letters of apology to the victims. 
25 minutes later. When Smith returned, he found that Williams had written nothing. He gave Williams another chance to do it and left the room. Later, when Smith returned, he saw that Russell Williams had indeed done some suck-holing. He had written five apologias with three omitted drafts. The first letter was to his wife, to whom he had been married for 19 years. Dearest Mary Elizabeth, I love you. I am so very sorry for having hurt you like this. I know you'll take good care of sweet Rosie, their cat. I love you, Russ. The next letter was to Roxanne Lloyd, mother of Jessica Lloyd. Mrs. Lloyd, you won't believe me, I know, but I am sorry for having taken your daughter from you. Jessica was a beautiful, gentle young woman, as you know. I know she loved you very much. She told me so, again and again. I can tell you that she did not suspect that the end was coming. Jessica was happy because she believed she was going home. I know you have already had a lot of pain in your life. I am sorry to have caused you so much more. This is from a previous draft of his letter to Roxanne Lloyd. Mrs. Lloyd, I know you won't believe me, but I am sorry for having taken your daughter from you. Jessica was a beautiful, gentle young woman. I know she loved you very much, though I forced her to have sex. The third draft of his letter to Roxanne Lloyd. Mrs. Lloyd, you won't believe me, I know, but I am sorry for having taken your daughter from you. Jessica was a beautiful, gentle young woman. I know she loved you very much because she told me she did again and again. The moment she died, she was quite happy because she believed I was going to let her go. She did not know what was coming. He stopped and scribbled through all the writing. At some point he had gone back and scratched out the moment and written immediately before over the top of it. This letter was to Jane Doe. I apologize for having traumatized you the way I did. No doubt you'll sleep a bit easier now that I've been caught. This was his letter to Lori Massacott. Lori, I am sorry for having hurt you the way I did. I really hope that the discussion we had has helped you turn your life around a bit. You seem like a bright woman who could do much better for herself. I do hope that you find a way to succeed. This letter was written to Ernie Como, father of Marie France. Mr. Como, I am sorry for having taken your daughter, Marie France, from you. I know you won't be able to believe me, but it is true. Marie France has been deeply missed by all that knew her. This is a previous draft of his letter to Ernie Como. Mr. Como, I am sorry for having taken your daughter from you. I know you won't be able to believe me, but it is the case. I know she has been deeply missed by all that knew her. A formal letter of condolence was sent to Mr. Como on official officer of the Wing Commander Military Stationery. Marie France was employed by the Armed Forces, and this letter was written and signed by Marie France's commanding officer. The letter went, Dear Mr. Como, I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of the men and women of Eight Wing Trenton to express my sincere condolences on the tragic death of your daughter. Marie France was a professional, caring, and compassionate woman who earned the respect of all with whom she came into contact. She set high standards for herself and others and was devoted to the well-being of those around her. Marie France made a lasting impact in Trenton and will be sorely missed by her many friends. Please let me know whether there is anything I can do to help you during this very difficult time. You and your family are in our thoughts and prayers. With our deepest sympathy, D.R. Williams, Colonel, Wing Commander. That is David Russell Williams. Williams led police to the location where he dumped Jessica Lloyd's body. It was on the outskirts of Tweed. Her head was still swaddled in towels, and she was placed behind a large rock, 40 feet from the nearest road.
Russell Williams was remanded to the segregation unit of Quinte Detention Center in Napanee, Ontario. A thorough search of Williams's cottage yielded some crucial findings and items to be submitted as evidence. Blood stains on the living room floor near the fireplace, where Williams noted that he hit Jessica with his flashlight. His Leatherman knife. His still camera. His camcorder. Two Hi8 videotapes and a SanDisk 4GB photo memory card were wrapped in black electrical tape and hidden in a piano. Williams was cooperative with the search because he didn't want to upset his wife with a search in their Ottawa home. February 11th, 2010. Police returned to the cottage for a second search. They found more blood stains, this time on a drawer in the master bedroom, wooden chair in the living room, and the chair's cushion, in addition to the bathtub. Other items found at the cottage. Electrical tape, duct tape, rope, black multi-purpose zip ties, computer equipment, a military-style duffel bag. The following items were stuffed into plastic bags and, in turn, placed inside the duffel bag for storage. Bag number one, 93 pairs of women's panties and one slip. Bag number two, four camisoles, six tops, 13 dresses, and one t-shirt. Bag number three, two women's bathing suits, two bikini bottoms, eight pairs of panties, one pair of tights, 18 camisoles, one pair of fishnet stockings, one garter, and one garter belt. Bag number four, one nighty, one panty and camisole set, one camisole, one pair of panties, and one slip. Bag number five, 51 pairs of panties. Bag number six, 35 pairs of panties. Bag number seven, 67 pairs of panties, three bathing suit tops, two bras, one bikini bottom, and two socks. Bag number eight, 49 bras. Aside from the lingerie items were sex toys and four by six sized photos of Jane Doe on vacation with her boyfriend. Warrants were also obtained to seize and search Williams's Pathfinder, as well as his office at CFB Trenton, a safety deposit box he shared with his wife at a location of the Bank of Montreal, his medical records, banking records, and his BlackBerry records. They also took samples of his DNA. Police searched Williams' Ottawa home. The following items were entered into the evidence trove. A book called LSI Guide to Lock Picking. One Sony digital camera. One black skull cap in a duffel bag beside the bed in their master bedroom. Air Force flight suits. Computer equipment and peripherals, including two 500 gigabyte external hard drives, were found that contained the following. Sexually explicit still photos and video footage of his attacks on Marie France Como and Jessica Lloyd. One spreadsheet of diary entries describing the crimes. One KRK systems box containing a plastic bag filled with female underwear and a Ziploc bag filled with lubricants. One APC battery backup box with two plastic bags within. Bag number one held four vibrators, six batteries, and a DVD called Real Sex Home Videos. Bag number two concealed 14 pairs of panties, 34 bras, two camisoles, and one slip. One pillowcase which contained five pairs of panties, one bra, two vibrators, pajama bottoms, a slip, and two pairs of children's panties. One green camera bag contained a Sony camera and a pair of blue panties. One Epson printer box containing two plastic bags. Bag number one held 13 pairs of panties, three bras, and a tube of KY jelly. 
Bag number two contained eight photos of Jessica Lloyd, Jessica Lloyd's student ID, four camisoles, one gray pair of sweatpants, ten bras, and twenty-two pairs of panties. Police also discovered photos and video footage of underage teen girls engaged in sexual acts. There were also stills and video of BDSM activity, though these materials were not produced by Williams. Who was Russell Williams, exactly? As previously mentioned, he was the commander of Canadian Forces Base Trenton. At that location, he presided over a staff of 4,000 military personnel and civilian workers. He was a high-ranking, decorated, and respected officer. Beyond the environs of CFB Trenton, he was a community leader who was friendly with municipal politicians. He appeared as a local celebrity at many community events. He competed against legendary golfer Johnny Bauer at a fundraiser to benefit the Military Family Resource Center. The organization provides assistance to the families of military personnel who have been wounded or killed in battle. He was a car dealer at a charity casino. He dropped a puck at a benefit for a girls' minor hockey league. He entertained at the local Rotary Club. He was present at gala fundraising dinners for local hospitals. Needless to say, he sowed a great deal of goodwill beyond the reaches of the military base. What conclusions could be drawn from this? Was this all a smokescreen for the ruthless rapist and murderer who lurked within? One thing's for sure. He acted in violation of the four tenets inscribed upon the commission scrolls of all Canadian Forces officers. Loyalty, integrity, truth, and courage. Russell Williams was brought into court for his first hearing. He did not make bail. The OPP issued a press release regarding Williams' charges. Man charged for two homicides and two home invasions. They went on to say that 46-year-old Russell Williams was charged with the first-degree murder of Jessica Lloyd, the first-degree murder of Marie France Como, two counts of forcible confinement, and two counts of breaking and entering, plus sexual assault. Four days after Jessica Lloyd's funeral, Jessica's favorite hockey player, Ty Domi of the Toronto Maple Leafs, sent a letter to her family. To the extended family of Jessica Lloyd, my most sincere condolences on the untimely loss of Jessica, a vibrant and warm lady with a strong sense of humor and close community and family connections, whose death tragically came too soon. You are in my thoughts at this difficult time. Ty. The Belly of the Beast David Russell Williams was born on March 7, 1963, in Bromsgrove, Worcestershire, England. Russell's family moved to Deep River, Ontario, Canada in October of that year. His father David became employed by Atomic Energy of Canada, who provided him and his family with a duplex. David was a highly educated white-collar professional, but some would have considered his attitudes regarding women to be a little backward for the progressive 1960s. He would belittle his wife, both in public and at home in front of Russell. He expected her to wait on him as if he were royalty. In 1965, David and Russell's mother, Christine, had another child, a second son named Harvey. Russell was remembered as a compliant and easygoing child, seldom disagreeable and unfailingly polite. Eventually, David and Christine's marriage disintegrated due to irreconcilable differences, though the divorce proceedings were fueled by the revelation that David had been unfaithful. In 1969, Christine took the boys and moved to a small bungalow in the town of Petawawa. Divorce can be rough on children, often leading to a spell of acting out. A social worker spoke with both Russell and his brother about their feelings regarding the divorce and separation. 
she wrote the following assessment about Russell. David Russell, born March 7, 1963, in Cardiff, England, is in good health and appears to be an active, precocious child with an interest in life and people. He appeared to have a close relationship with the petitioner, mother, who was very involved in her children's activities. Russell appears very compatible with his brother. He is attending grade one in the Herman Street Public School, Petawawa, and appears above average in reading and printing ability. His creative ability appears mature and vocabulary expansive. Russell's relationship with the respondent, father, is also very close, and he enjoys visits with him. Having resided within the vicinity of an Air Force base, young Russell became fascinated with military aircraft. He also developed a passion for music, especially jazz, and he became proficient at playing the piano and trumpet by his early teen years. In high school, Russell demonstrated such a high standard in his trumpet playing that he was promoted to the school's senior band. In secondary school, he was neither popular nor an outcast. His female classmates were not especially taken with him. Eventually, his success as a musician led to a feeling of arrogance. As drummer and former alumnus Tony Callahan put it, I didn't hate the guy. I just didn't like him. I just thought he was a bit strange. He just thought he was something better than everyone else. He seemed to be a bit of a loner. I just didn't see anybody that wanted to hang with him. Russell did have a girlfriend for a couple of years in high school named Sarah. They bonded over their love of music. While some remembered Russell as being socially awkward and quiet, especially around girls, Tony Callahan insisted that Russell's arrogance spilled out into his social interactions. As Callahan put it, he was annoying. He was always telling stupid jokes, trying to be funny, or putting something on someone's seat. Mischievous, lame things like that. He seemed like a bit of a doofus the way he acted sometimes. But then there was nothing to lead me to believe that he was capable of being a colonel in the Air Force either. Eventually, Russell was enrolled at Canada's prestigious Upper Canada College Preparatory School for his last year of secondary education. Many students chafed against the rigidly structured and authoritarian environment, but not Russell. As his former roommate tells it, at boarding school, a lot of guys like to goof around and have some fun. He was always serious and didn't get into the banter, joking, and friendship aspect of it all. It was very difficult to have just a basic conversation with him. I can't even recall him having a single person he spent a lot of time with, and I never recall seeing him with a woman. It became clear at the age of 17 that Russell possessed the ingredients for a successful career in the armed forces. The Air Force was never in the market for comedians, so anyone who was content to take orders and carry them out as directed was a shoe-in. In fact, as he was attending university, he was very much a leader in his dorm, establishing schedules and protocol for chores and other duties related to household upkeep. Some bristled at his dictatorial approach, calling him Sergeant Major, Drill Sergeant, and Mother Goose. Russell generally avoided partying and primarily focused on his studies, though he was fond of playing pranks. Most of them were old school, like placing a sheet of plastic wrap on the rim of a toilet bowl. Hopefully there were no bulimics in that dorm. In 1986, Russell went to see one of the year's top hit movies, Top Gun. He had just been dumped by a girl and his self-esteem took a knock. He had always been fascinated by aircraft, especially the types utilized by the military. Something about being a pilot of a jet or being some other kind of combat aviator struck him as glamorous and heroic. He signed up for flying lessons at Toronto's Buttonville Municipal Airport. A friend's uncle owned a Cessna and invited Russell to accompany him on a flight. 
He even invited Russell to take the controls once they were in the sky. Russell loved the triumphant control of piloting a plane. Flying is risky, but the rewards for him personally overshadowed the potential consequences of what might go wrong. He was hooked. Soon after this experience, he went to a recruiting center for the Canadian Forces in downtown Toronto. He also applied to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. It was a rigorous screening process, but he was accepted. However, his first choice was the military, and in late 1987, he reported to an Air Force base in Chilliwack, British Columbia, for basic training, where he started as a cadet. Williams became a highly distinguished and reputable pilot. He was highly skilled and frequently decorated and rose so highly up the ranks of the Royal Canadian Air Force that he was entrusted with the task of piloting planes for Canadian prime ministers, foreign dignitaries, and members of the British royal family, whether on domestic or international flights. There was no doubt among the brass of the Canadian Air Force that Russell Williams was an elite pilot with a solid and dedicated approach to his work. He expected a high standard from himself and reliably delivered. People like this don't come across as creepy lowlifes with the potential to inflict undue harm on innocent people up to and including murder. Williams' colleagues remember him as being cool under pressure and unlikely to become upset at being inconvenienced. He was generally disinclined to socialize with co-workers, and when he did, he kept his alcohol consumption to a minimum to avoid any kind of dereliction of duty. He was polite, though very distant. Nobody among his crew ever really got to know him. If you're going to live a double life, one of them had better be the living embodiment of conformity and conventionality. You could do a lot worse than one of the country's premier aviators and commander of an Air Force base. That was Russell Williams at the height of his normalcy. It was a facade, to be sure, fortified by an iron window whose opacity kept prying eyes and intruding bodies out of the twilight between the hero committed to national service and the rapist and murderer fixated on dominating and destroying those who would not follow his directives voluntarily. His staff at the base were required to follow his orders, but it was beyond the boundaries of CFB Trenton where the submission of others had to be earned, and for people who relish control as much as Russell Williams, such a democratic model was at odds with his sexual ethos. It is unclear what caused Williams' sexual pathology to take root. Whether it was an inborn tendency or due to side effects of medications he took to alleviate arthritis pain, the cause may likely never be known. What is known is the date when his nefarious sexual proclivities first began to manifest. The date was September 8, 2007. Williams's next-door neighbors at his cottage were out of town visiting relatives in Sudbury. It was a lengthy commute, and they were likely to spend a couple of days there, so he had plenty of time to invade their privacy. Not just anybody's privacy. They had a 12-year-old daughter named Samantha. He had a history with the girl. She taught him how to play cribbage, fed his cat when he was absent, and baked muffins for him. She admired him so much, she even assembled a school project about him. In a community so heavily populated with military personnel, both active and retired, it would not have been surprising to any of the locals that one of their young people would hold Colonel Williams in such high esteem. As much as Russell appreciated the favors and the scholastic tribute, his fondness for the girl wasn't nearly as wholesome. He felt a great deal of overwhelming lust for her that was nevertheless well-contained. Until that day. 
At 9.30 p.m., he walked over to their house and found that a door had been left unlocked. He had spent a lot of time with her family, but as he saw it, not nearly enough time in their daughter's private space. He brought his still camera with him and took several shots of her bedroom. At first, he documented the environment as a whole, but eventually the focus was redirected to her underwear drawers, the clothes in her closet, and her bed. Foreshadowing a practice that was to define him in the near future, he removed all his clothes and put on a pair of Samantha's panties. He posed for some selfies. His erection was impossible not to notice. He removed the panties and hung them from his still erect penis as he took more selfies. He lay down on her bed, still naked. He began to masturbate. He set the camera up on a tripod and modeled more of Samantha's undergarments, including her training bras. By the time he left the house, he had taken 36 pictures, among them three shots of his ejaculate on her underwear. He took six pairs of Samantha's panties with him as souvenirs when he departed. When the family returned, nobody noticed anything out of the ordinary, not even Samantha. The experience was euphoric for Williams, and the vice became a drug. September 28, 2007. Russell Williams broke into Samantha's family's home a second time. The family were out of town attending a funeral. At 11 p.m., he entered the house through the same unlocked door in the rear. He went directly to Samantha's bedroom. He draped several of her outfits and undergarments over his erection. He took several selfies of himself modeling some of her panties and skirts. According to the metadata logged in the camera, there was a seven-hour lag between the first set of photos and the second. Whether he spent the night in Samantha's bed or returned the next morning to resume his activities, he was back at 8.02 a.m. to take 22 more photos. Once again, the emphasis was on her underwear drawer, her closet, and her bed. In ten of the pictures, Williams is either standing or lying on her bed naked and masturbating with her underwear as stimulus. This transpired over a space of 17 minutes. 5.04 p.m. Williams took 41 more photos. This time, the risk of being witnessed was escalated. He posed in the forest nearby, wearing Samantha's underwear and masturbating into them. This was so arousing for him that he was seldom flaccid during the photo session. 11 p.m. Apparently it killed Russell Williams to spend any amount of time outside of Samantha's bedroom. He took 11 more selfies of him naked, except for Samantha's underwear, and masturbating in a frenzy. Williams took similar photos at home with the panties he stole. Russell Williams was an avid jogger, but he wasn't motivated purely by a desire to stay in shape. He kept his eyes open for attractive women especially if he observed them outside of their homes. He would make a mental note of their comings and goings in terms of times and dates. October 19, 2007 Russell Williams snuck into the home of his friend Larry Jones's daughter. She had twin girls who were 11 years old. As he did with Samantha's inner sanctum, he took photos of their room their mother's room, the girls' underwear drawers, and some undergarments he discovered in a dryer. The items consisted of bras, panties, and a bathing suit. All told, he stole 23 garments as documented with his camera. He arranged them on the floor and took photos of them as if preparing them for a catalog spread. This time there was a witness. 
though they did not realize the intruder was Russell Williams. They only described the man they saw running from the house as a, quote, thin man. The man chased him on his all-terrain vehicle, but Williams was an athlete and experienced in the military, so escaping on foot was elementary to him. The man lost sight of him. Before Williams graduated from home invasion to rape and murder, he had broken into 48 different homes. In 13 incidents, his target was a female minor. Rarely were these incidents detected or reported. Williams cataloged the items he stole meticulously. They were entered into separate folders on his desktop computer, which was also used by his wife. Each photographed item was documented with the date and time the item was pilfered. He even included the addresses and names of the victims, the number and kind of items he took, and any other details he considered to be noteworthy. He would even create subfolders, classifying them with names like basement laundry, bedroom, and daughter's collection. He felt sentimental about these incidents, like his hard drive was becoming a prowler's scrapbook. Williams was usually very conscientious about leaving the scene of the crime with no indicators of what he had done. The problem was, just like with a drug, eventually a little is not enough, and a larger dose is what it takes to get you high. In this case, the risk he was taking provided that rush he was seeking. Pressing his luck, he left one of the homes with substantial incriminating traces. He left a basement window open after leaving. He didn't clean up streaks of mud that were left on the interior wall beneath it. He tracked wet leaves from the basement to the main floor. In one of the girls' bedrooms, a photo album was left over to a page that displayed her expired photo ID. In another girl's room, he left several 4x6 photographs of her and her friends spread out on the floor. Most indicative of his desire to give her the chills, he switched on her computer and created a one-word Microsoft Word document, that word being Merci. He accessed some of her private files on the computer, though she wouldn't find out about it until after he was brought to justice. November 1st, 2008. The East Ender, a newspaper in the township of Orleans, published an article about this rash of crimes entitled Police Search for Leads in Pair of Bizarre Break-Ins. The article. Police are looking for information in a pair of East residential break-ins in which the only items taken were female undergarments. Both break-ins occurred in the Fallingbrook area last weekend. Police are reminding residents in Fallingbrook to make sure their doors are locked, especially during the evening and overnight. Anyone with information is asked to call police or crime stoppers. Local police and the OPP launched an investigation. Williams was upping the ante when it came to risking arrest, but his standards were not commensurate throughout this upward trajectory. While invading a 15-year-old girl's bedroom, he found a pair of panties that had been stained by menstruation. Williams was turned on by this, and the sensual overload compelled him to lick and kiss the stain. He wore the panties over his head like a mask. The stain part of the panties was placed over his nose. He took 70 pictures of this item. The last 12 of them featured Williams masturbating and ejaculating onto the stain. January 1st, 2009. Russell Williams broke into the home of Constantine and Brian Rogers. It was their 15-year-old daughter, who captured Russell Williams' interest. He broke into their home and went straight to her room. He took pictures of the room itself and followed up by stealing 68 items of clothing. He cleared out her underwear drawer. 
He took photos of headshots she had posed for as submissions for a modeling agency. A page marked with her lip gloss was also documented with his camera. He returned the next evening for more of the same. This time he removed his clothes and posed for selfies, naked and wearing the girls' outfits. In one of the photos, he held one of her makeup brushes against his penis. He took eight more articles of clothing, including a pair of shoes. He did not take the makeup brush with him. Police found a deposit of semen on her dresser, but by the time it was found, it was not suitable for forensic analysis. Besides, Russell Williams didn't have a criminal record, so they couldn't have traced it to him if he were not already a suspect. The girl refused to sleep in her room alone at night for several months after the invasion. When Williams uploaded the pictures to his computer, he placed them in a folder he called HNY, which stood for Happy New Year. In June 2009, he broke into the home of a 24-year-old woman and her father, whereupon he stole 186 items of the woman's clothing, which included undergarments and dresses. He spent two and a half hours posing naked for selfies and masturbating on her bed while wearing one of her camisoles. At some point, he wrote a letter he intended to leave for the woman. The letter insinuated that the culprit was a teenaged boy. The contents of the letter. Beautiful, with her name removed, for confidentiality purposes. I'm sorry I took these because I am sentimental too. Don't worry, because I didn't mess with them. Also, I am sure you know you're beautiful, but trust me, your pussy smells fucking awesome. I should know because I've been doing this for a while. But I am going to stop because my mom will fucking kill me if I get caught. She is pretty sure I can be something. Besides, your place was kind of like the mother load, and I really like that I have a bunch of undies you put on just after you got fucked. I started this with a chick I knew from high school called, name deleted, who lives down the road from you. I thought it would be cool to have some of her undies. It seems right that I finish with a special chick like you. If you decide to call the cops, tell them that I am sorry for the trouble and they won't hear from me again. Now that I know all about you, I think it might be cool to meet you. Maybe younger guys don't turn you on, but I think we could be good together. To me, teenage chicks are impressed too easy. I guess I would like to be with somebody more experienced. You guys really need to clean out the bath in the basement. It is some gnarly. I hope what I did ain't pissed you off too much. JT P.S. Since I sort of feel guilty about wasting the cops' time, these are the places I hit so they can close their books. He closed the letter by providing a detailed record of all the break-and-enters he had committed since May 9, 2008. In the same folder as this letter was a screenshot of the victim's Facebook profile and five screenshots of the Ottawa Police website's report on the incident. July 11, 2009. Russell Williams was poised in the backyard of a house where a woman resided. After she disrobed and entered her shower, he removed his own clothes and entered her house naked. He had invaded this house six times, and he would do it again on three more occasions. He went to her bedroom and stole a pair of her panties from her dresser drawer and snuck out of the house with the item that he would customarily refer to as one of his, quote, trophies. Police found a document in his computer that outlined the experience for the historical record. On naked walk from back 40, after having watched her for 30 minutes or so and confident that she was home alone, I entered her house naked just after she got into the shower. Very tempting to take her panties bra from bathroom, decided it would be entirely obvious that someone was in the house while she was in the shower. 
took panties from panty drawer instead. Just days later, he was promoted to commander of CFB Trenton in a ceremony marked by significant pomp and circumstance. Only days later, he resumed his habit of breaking into houses and soiling and stealing the undergarments of the female occupants. One such occupant was a 14-year-old girl. He broke into her family's home and stole five pieces of her lingerie, which included panties, bras, and a camisole. He wrote about this endeavor in a document that was found in his computer. I've been wanting to get into her bedroom for a long time had screen out and window open a few weeks ago, but that time it was quite late, and the dogs were barking in the basement. This time, the back porch door was open. After I'd collected what I'd wanted, I'd stripped naked in the backyard. I was jerking off, preparing to go back in and get a shot lying on her sheets when her dad came home. She followed within ten minutes. While I was in her room, I took the liberty of moving her guitar slightly so I could see her bed from outside, little ladder lying there. I watched her lie down and, within ten minutes, turn out the light. Unfortunately, I didn't catch her changing, maybe tomorrow night, in bed. While in custody, Russell Williams attempted suicide by forcing a toilet paper roll filled with paper and foil down his throat. Correctional officers intervened in time and saved his life. Williams wrote a suicide note in mustard, which had been provided with his meals. He was placed on suicide watch. A statement of claim document outlined the long-term effects of Williams' assault on Jane Doe. She reported that she could no longer trust anybody or even function normally in society, and that included becoming employed. She suffered from depression, addiction, and suicidal ideation. She began intensive psychotherapy with a counselor starting in November 2009. She was unable to provide for her children and could not engage in sexual congress. A judge instituted a publication ban on her real name, and it has never been publicized in Canada. It was under those conditions that her lawsuit against both Russell Williams and his wife could proceed. Though his wife had not participated in or planned any of his crimes, she co-owned his properties so she was dragged into the proceedings. Jane Doe's lawyers were seeking $2 million in damages. William's wife launched a defense against the suit. October 18, 2010, the first day of Russell Williams' sentencing hearing, which was to take place at the Superior Court of Justice. Police anticipated hostility from the press and the public. So incensed was the local population by Williams's crimes that police snipers were positioned atop the roofs of several buildings, including a church. All entrance to the court building passed through a metal detector. Russell Williams was indicted on 88 charges. After each charge was read, he was asked how he intended to plead, and he responded with, Guilty, Your Honor. Photos Williams took at the crime scenes were displayed to the court. Every shot of him wearing lingerie, every portrait of him masturbating and ejaculating on the undergarments of adolescent females, it was all laid bare. In some shots, toys and collectibles belonging to prepubescent girls were visible in the background. After all, the youngest girl he targeted was nine years old. Williams' portfolio included approximately 3,000 photos. DNA from the victims and the crime scenes found matches for that of Russell Williams. His guilt was even further consolidated in the view of the court. Jessica Lloyd's friend Lisa gave a victim impact statement to the court, going as far as to address Williams directly. When he heard his name, he looked her in the eye. Up until then, he had been looking at the floor. 
from Lisa's statement. I no longer trust anyone, whether it is a stranger, neighbor, or even someone in a uniform. The very person whose job it was to protect my country and keep me safe was actually terrorizing my local community. Jessica's Aunt Deborah said, I can't laugh without feeling guilt. I can't sleep without waking up and seeing her beautiful little face asking for our help. She drew her only comfort from knowing what awaited Williams throughout the subsequent years of incarceration. He will never be able to overpower another woman again. He will never give another order again. Instead, he will take the orders now. He will know what it's like to not be in control of his life. Someone else will be calling the shots. Jessica's mother bared her soul and her pain was palpable to all. There's no punishment that could make this better for me. No sentencing will make this sorrow disappear. He did not give any mercy to Jessica. No amount of suffering that Russell Williams might feel after today can compare to the suffering we have felt. I would gladly take her place. I would die for her. Justice Robert Scott asked Russell Williams if he wanted to deliver a statement before receiving his sentence. Emotional, with a tissue in hand to wipe his tears, he made the following remarks. I stand before you, Your Honor, indescribably ashamed. I know that the crimes I have committed have traumatized many people. The families and friends of Marie France Como and Jessica Lloyd in particular have suffered and continue to suffer profound, desperate pain and sorrow as a result of what I've done. My assaults of Ms. Doe and Ms. Massacott have caused them to suffer terribly as well, I know. He got choked up and wiped more tears as they fell down his face. He had more. Numerous victims of the break and enters I have committed have been very seriously distressed as a result of my so having invaded their most intimate privacy. My family, Your Honor, has been irreparably harmed. The understandable hatred that was expressed yesterday and has been palpable throughout the week has me recognize that most will find it impossible to accept, but the fact is I very deeply regret what I have done and the harm that I know I have caused to many. I have committed despicable crimes, Your Honor, and in the process betrayed my family, my friends, and colleagues, and the Canadian forces. I shall spend the rest of my life regretting, above all, that I have ended two vibrant, innocent, and cherished lives. My very sincere hope is that my detailed confession on the night of February 7th, my full cooperation with investigators since, and ultimately my guilty pleas earlier this week have, in some way, served to temper the very, very serious harm I have caused my victims and their families and friends. Thank you, Your Honor. A military colleague of Williams, Janet Wright, said following his statement, I think he knows he's sick. I did think he was sincere, though. The judge felt the same way as reflected on his evaluation of Williams. I take into account Mr. Williams' statement to this court. I found it to be sincere. Although not insane, it appears that Mr. Williams was and remains a very sick individual, but a very dangerous man, nevertheless. There is a saying that we've all used, Nothing surprises me any more. That adage has no meaning here. The depths of the depravity demonstrated by Russell Williams has no equal. One suspects that he has contained for most of his life sexual desires and fetishes. However, in 2007, these inner thoughts began to control his private actions, pushing him deeper and deeper into criminal behavior which culminated in the brutal and senseless murders of two innocents. Russell Williams will forever be remembered as a sadosexual serial killer. Russell Williams lived a charmed life, 
the best of education, a leader of men and women, a respected rising star, and our beloved armed forces. His double life fooled most people. Our thoughts and prayers are with all the victims. Marie France did not have to die. Jessica did not have to die. May all of you find the peace that you desperately deserve. Justice Scott sentenced Russell Williams to two concurrent life sentences for the murders of Jessica Lloyd and Marie France Como with no possibility of parole for at least 25 years. He was also slapped with a one-year term for all 82 burglary-related convictions. He was given 10 years for every sexual assault and forcible confinement conviction. These are to be served concurrently with the life sentences. He was also required to pay a surcharge fine of $100 for all 88 offenses he committed. This money will be allocated to the surviving victims. Russell Williams' DNA was entered into the RCMP National DNA Bank. A file was created and submitted to the sex offender database, and he is forbidden from ever possessing a firearm again. All evidence except for the still photographs and video footage was destroyed. Though Williams was stripped of his rank and all decorations he accumulated during his time in service, he was still eligible to collect a pension of $60,000 a year. This, in addition to the 125000 taxpayer dollars that will be spent every year for the provisions of his shelter and care in prison. For as long as Russell Williams is alive, everyone will be paying a price for his crimes. First the victims, and then the common Canadian as their labors are taxed and reallocated onto his dinner plate every night. We've all been violated by Russell Williams' actions. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.